Chapter One of My Religion, Arnold Bennett. It is curious how bold some very ordinary statements seem when they are put into print in a popular newspaper. I do not believe, and never have at any time believed, in the divinity of Christ, the virgin birth, the immaculate conception, heaven, hell, the immortality of the soul, the divine inspiration of the Bible. These denials of belief are taken for granted in the conversation of the vast majority of my friends and acquaintances and far from seeming bold they are so commonplace to us that we very rarely trouble to repeat them much less argue about them there are exceptions i know personally one or two men of real intelligence who stand by the tenets of the anglican variety or some other variety of christian doctrine though always with considerable mental reservations also i read one or two contemporary christian writers who appear to me to possess real intelligence i respect these believers and all believers but broadly speaking the christian dogma does not enter into my social spiritual or intellectual life at all nor does the dogma of any other religion of all the oriental creeds of which i have knowledge the christian creed is to me the least satisfactory save only that of mohammedanism it should be remembered that the christian creed is oriental every occidental creed in europe has died out on the other hand the moral teaching of christ makes a most powerful appeal to me and i should not care to assert that in the field of morals christ was not the greatest man that ever lived all religious dogma of course assumes that there is a future life and most of it deals with the influence of our earthly conduct upon the future life if here we do or believe such and such things we shall be rewarded beyond the grave if we do or believe such and such other things we shall be punished beyond the grave these dogmas vary in different religions and often within the same religion and are sometimes mutually contradictory none of them has ever appealed to me sufficiently to persuade me of its truth i have therefore kept an open mind about them but long ago i ceased to feel any interest in any of them being convinced that i could never arrive at any definite conclusion concerning them and hence that to occupy myself with them was a waste of my time there may be a heaven there may be a hell and also there may not be i don't know and i feel sure that on earth i never shall know on a balance of probabilities i am inclined to accept the theory of a future life and i am fairly sure that if indeed there is a future life my conduct in this present life will materially affect the nature of it further than this i do not go cannot go and do not wish to go is there a god call this phenomenon a first cause a supreme being a creator what you like god is a good name for it i believe that there is a god if only for the reason that i can imagine no other explanation of a marvellous scientifically ordered and law-controlled universe this argument is called the argument from design and it presents itself to me as a pretty good argument but what may be the attributes of god and his ultimate aim i have not the slightest idea and i do not exercise my brain in trying to decide what his aim is because i feel that my brain is utterly unequal to so sublime a problem and could not possibly solve it why should i agitate myself over a matter which exceeds my mental powers i do not agitate myself there is however another argument for the existence of god which for me is more cogent even than the rather physical argument from design namely that in every one of us is a force which we call conscience a force which tends always in the direction of justice mercy and kindness nobody is without a conscience the conduct of nobody is entirely uninfluenced by his conscience the universality of conscience together with the broad uniformity of its influence on conduct convinces me far more satisfactorily than anything else that it must have been implanted in us by a creator who had a clear aim whatever that aim may be in the creation and slow evolution of his universe 
i got this idea many years since from tolstoy's anna karenina and it has never left me as this is i think my only faith and as it directly implies works my religion is necessarily a religion of works rather than of faith i absolutely dismiss the extraordinary and too convenient notion that a man may safely do as he chooses provided he dies in a certain faith such a notion insults my reason i do not say that it insults everybody's reason for obviously it does not but merely that it insults mine i am for works unceasingly and all the time i think that every act counts forever either for or against the ultimate fulfilment of happiness i might say every thought as well as every act but in my view a thought is an act and just as much as an act influences the development of the individuality i do not believe that a man can think evil and do good if i despise a fellow-creature and scornfully give him a sovereign to help him out of a hole i am both thinking evil and doing evil it seems to me that christ better than anybody understood the secret of happiness which is the avowed end of all religious beliefs christ taught an all-embracing sympathy he taught humility meekness he taught us to judge not that we be not judged he taught forgiveness he taught the return of good for evil in a word his religion was in practice the religion of kindliness i do not hold that kindliness comprises the whole of works and that nothing else matters far from it but i do hold that without kindliness mercy humility forgiveness and such acts as the suffering of fools gladly no amount of works can be effective or have any real value in a religious sense and i hold further that the cultivation often painfully difficult of these virtues should constitute the main part of religion that in their absence no belief in dogma can be effective and that these virtues can be effective without any dogma whatever they alone refine the soul nourish the deepest roots of existence and make happiness possible i can see all round me examples of men brilliantly successful in riches power learning and creative genius who are restless dissatisfied and unhappy because they have despised these virtues these virtues are social virtues the most important of all virtues i think that christianity as a force might have effectively and lustily survived if it had not for centuries so notoriously forgotten the teaching of its own founder what will take the place of dogmatic christianity i cannot guess but i have a conviction that whatever it is if it is not based on kindliness it will fail End of chapter one. Chapter two. Hugh Walpole. Religion has become in these post war days so individual a thing that no one is afraid of speaking of it. The time has long passed for religious persecution, whether social, moral, or political, and I suppose if you were to question nine out of ten grown men and women of today as to their religious experience, they would describe to you an evolution through three states of discovery. First, the child's acceptance of the dogmas handed over to it by its elders. Second, the adolescent's reaction against that acceptance and third the evolution of some positive personal opinion born of personal experience i myself passed through exactly these three stages i was bred up in the very heart of church of england teaching i saw it working on every side of me the only grown-up people i ever saw believed or appeared to believe implicitly in these teachings until i was eighteen or nineteen i did no direct active thinking about religion but simply accepted what i was given i went to church twice every sunday and was bored part of the time and sentimentally moved by hymns emotional sermons and lights and colors 
i made the discovery made by all children that no one was perfect and that to be a clergyman or a church worker or a choir boy did not mean that you were removed from the world of hasty temper ill-speaking and slandering and dangerous imaginings i was a choir boy myself but i never thought during this period as to whether the dogmas of the church of england were for me true or false i accepted them as certain i was intended to be a clergyman and to give me experience i was sent for a year to work in a mission for seamen in liverpool it was there that everything crumbled before the realities of life that i was now facing i was compelled to ask myself questions i met constantly men much older than i much wiser than i and much braver than i who did not believe one of the things that i accepted as true suddenly with a precipitancy far too crude i believed in nothing i decided that i would not be a clergyman from this moment until the outbreak of war in nineteen fourteen i was occupied i think with discovering how beautiful and exciting and amusing this world was and especially my place in it the beauty of nature and the art and the human lives around me was translated easily by me into what i fancied was religion that is i myself was having an exciting time was in good health was free to move about the world and was pursuing an art that was far more generous in what it gave than in what i could give to it i imagined easily and complacently a loose and vague condition of benevolence in which everything was intended for the best and every one got what he deserved then the war came and with its coming a vague sense of fear that had been with me ever since i was a small child at a private school was translated into very positive experience like millions of others i who had never before seen more than the death of a bird witnessed day after day every kind of horror indeed i believe that the retreat of the russian army back to tarnopol in the second year of the war offered even more persistent experiences of horror distress and wasted life than many other phases of the war and yet undoubtedly the main experience that i got from the war was the unimportance of physical death again and again and again it was impressed on me whether i wished it or not that the cessation of bodily life did not mean the cessation of spiritual life spiritual life is so vague a phrase that i am reluctant to use it but what i mean is that i became gradually suspicious that something of far greater import than the life of the body was involved in the history of each individual i say suspicious because now at the age of forty-one i can for myself speak with no positive certainty i have witnessed that certainty of immortality in many others and i have also many friends to whom the possibility of anything but material life seems absurd but at the last one can learn only through one's own experience the important point for me was that after the second year of the war i was conscious in myself of the existence of some other life besides my physical one i had not wished nor asked for it i had done nothing definite myself towards the creation of it it was simply there as my face and hands and feet were there as i became increasingly aware of this second life i became increasingly anxious to avoid falsehood with regard to it i told myself that it was there because i wished it or because i was sentimental or because i was egoistic and could not bear to think of my own individuality fading into nothing in so short a time or because i cared for certain people very deeply and did not wish that physical death should separate us or because the idea of immortality of one kind or another gave the whole of life a largeness and beauty that it otherwise did not have i began to read a good deal on mystical subjects but my brain is neither philosophical nor accurate and i found that in general i got very little help from books moreover i discovered after a while that this second life continued to develop and grow 
apart from anything that i did or wished its growth did not influence very greatly my actions i was not on the whole a better man because of it my good actions sprang in the main from social or personal causes because i did not wish to hurt someone's feelings because i was afraid of public opinion or because i was afraid of myself but i did discover that as time passed the horizon widened my values changed things became interesting to me that had never been interesting before i wanted more time for silence and quiet not because i began to think marvelously or experience any kind of remote ecstasies but it was rather as though something was pushing its way in spite of myself through the stuff of my nature i began to believe with keats that the purpose of life was the education of the soul i am well aware how desperately vague this is no man of forty can claim that his experience of life is either final or definite but at the present i think my credo is that i believe that one of the first necessities for a human being is an absolute tolerance of the religious discoveries of every other human being that a completely materialistic explanation of our life on this planet accounts less and less for many of our inner experiences that more and more clearly as one grows the teachings of christ stripped of the dogmas that others have put on them apply with amazing wisdom and knowledge to modern conditions and that no amount of feeble living and persistent moral failure on one's own part alters the fundamental wisdom of these teachings it seems to me that in general the people of our time are passing from rather blind obedience to dogmatic teaching to an active demand for some freer more individual spiritual life i believe that many men today would agree with me in this that they are experiencing spiritual history almost against their will and that the marvelous modern progress of science will in the end bring men more securely into religious belief rather than away from it end of chapter two chapter three rebecca west provided that there is affection in a family the father and mother confirm when they are old the miracle they performed when they were young then they loved and gave their children life now they die and make that gift absolute by taking away the fear of death from their children for after one has watched a dying person with the clairvoyant eye of affection the idea of death as a triumph of decay passes forever one perceives that he is not ceasing to exist but passing into another universe the transition may be excruciatingly painful quite possibly he takes with him no memory of this life and there is no reason to suppose that the other universe is more careful of its inhabitants than this but it is at any rate a universe of greater beauty than this of that one is made aware by an intuition which tells us constantly throughout life that there are certain actions we perform and emotions we feel which though they may not be injurious or repellent and may indeed be pleasurable and harmless are limited to this universe one knows therefore that just so far as such actions and emotions predominate in one's life one will perish with this universe a drunkard a man who spends his whole life in playing some game like tennis or chess a prostitute who spends her whole life in mechanical sexual acts which have no physical or spiritual consequence a county hostess who spends her whole life in trivial social activities all these die when they die but there are other actions and emotions of greater nobility and intensity which print through this universe and make an impression on that other universe and just so far as such actions and emotions predominate in one's life one does not die in death anyone who warmly loves anyone else anyone who creates good art or sound thought anyone who achieves courage and generosity anyone who does any work well what such as these do happens not only in this life which passes but in another life which continues 
these certainties of mine cannot be proved by any logical process but i do not find that in the least disturbing for it is not necessary that they should be i am sure enough of them the only use of any logical proof would be to convince other people of their reality and that i do not want to do for i am certain that everybody has the same chance of receiving these intuitions that i have indeed were i the only person or one of a restricted number of persons who could receive them then this would be such an unjust cosmos that i would lose all interest in it and seek annihilation by confining myself to the actions and emotions which perish with this world since this is so i should be afraid to convince anybody else of the reality of my intuitions for as the human animal is above all things indolent he would probably accept my proof as an assurance that life has a meaning and would refrain from seeking for his own revelation which alone can give him that assurance in a form suited to the individual needs of his soul i do not believe that membership of any christian church would heighten my consciousness of these intuitions or help me to act on them i occasionally go to church i go sometimes to nonconformist services because it seems to me that in the preachers you hear there and in the congregations that listen to them you get as fine a preoccupation with problems of conduct and duty as have probably ever been shown by any people since the world began these people certainly do not believe in hell i doubt if more than a few seriously believe in any system of rewards for the virtuous in the afterlife but they are passionately anxious to be good just for the sake of being good they are anxious for no other reason than altruism to find out exactly what their duty to their fellow-men is and how they can best perform it i go also to roman catholic churches at times for the sake of the ritual that seems to me to be of great value because it draws a picture of spiritual facts which human language still finds it difficult to express adequately or in a form equally comprehensible by all kinds of people when one sees a beautiful church full of worshippers kneeling in attitudes of adoration in front of an altar where a cardinal in robes the very colour of power and majesty abases himself before a cross on which there hangs a naked man who was poor and despised and rejected one gets a complete expression of a certain group of spiritual ideas that can struggle into words only one aspect at a time what is written on the tomb of hafetz o heart be a slave to the king of the world and be a king writes like a flash of lightning the spiritual truth that if one is to live with dignity one must bend one's will to a purpose other than one's own well-being but the ritual in the church says it better and it says more nevertheless i feel that christianity must be regarded not as a final revelation but as a phase of revelation the creative spirit in forming the world which you may call god if you like produced christ to satisfy the spiritual needs of man as he was during the centuries that resulted in the establishment of modern europe he was then for the most part very poor whether he was poor or rich he was racked by diseases he could not understand an unorganized economic system and lack of knowledge subjected him to famines and an unresolved political system involved him in constant warfare in such a harsh and unsettled world he might well doubt if the law of the universe were not hate and the meaning of life bitterness christ came to comfort him against these adversities he proved to him that poverty and suffering could be borne so sweetly that they exalted a man above the proudest and richest king he struck back some of the world's swords by preaching the beauty of peace he assured man that love was a power in the universe by coming to render him these services though he knew he must pay for it with his life but certain forms which christianity had to take to satisfy the needs of the man of that age are unsuited to the man of this age there is for instance the doctrine of the virgin birth 
the ordinary pre-christian man was not accustomed to the idea of moral power unsupported by force it would have been impossible to convince him that a man was divine simply because his behavior was supremely beautiful therefore christ had to be recommended to him by the ascription of a miraculous origin now that we have had christ's lesson set before us this is quite unnecessary ecclesiastics who talk about the virgin birth are as absurd as persons would be who having been visited by the wisest man in the world stopped repeating his wisdom to an audience longing to hear it and wrangled whether he had travelled to their house by a bus or a tramcar the doctrine of the atonement is to me as irrelevant that a father should invent the laws of a game knowing that they must be broken force people to play it sentence the players to punishment for breaking them and accept the agony of his son as a substitute for the punishment was credible enough to people who believed that hate might be the ultimate law of life to us who have been given the christian idea of love and mercy as an essential part of divinity it is not credible nor is it necessary man was in a dark place christ came to comfort why man had to be in a dark place we do not and cannot know for our half-grown brains obviously cannot grasp the whole truth about the universe but we do ourselves a mischief if we do not admit our ignorance and retain an explanation which is neither true nor useful but when christianity is stripped of doctrines that were created to serve a special purpose but now serve none there is no reason to suppose that it is the final revelation of the divine to humanity there might quite possibly come another world that would be to us as absolute a solvent of our difficulties about life as christianity was to the difficulties of the early christians i find confirmation of that hope in the feeling of sacredness that i intuitively perceive in all efforts to extend the sphere of personal liberty when we let people do what they like and say what they like we are giving the divine a chance to express itself when it comes the spirit of tolerance represents the merciful hand of christ thrust through ages saving the next christ from crucifixion End of chapter three chapter four sir arthur conan doyle it must be an easy matter to write of one's religion when that religion has been inherited from one's ancestors endorsed by one's own mental acquiescence and remained unchanged as the explanation and guide of life but it is different when in attempted pursuit of truth one has sought and tested and proved and discarded with a firm determination never never to assent to that which one's reason condemns then it is a difficult and even a painful task for it involves probing deeply into the springs of action in one's own soul i was born into a roman catholic family and was educated as such even now i must admit that if i were forced to become an orthodox christian and to justify my position by scriptural texts or by an appeal to the traditions of the early church i would again be a catholic as an abstract creed its position is strong as a practical system it has produced both the most christian and the most unchristian types of any religion i could on the one hand imagine nothing more opposed to all that christ stood for than a dominican familiar the most dreadful figure in all history or a borgia pope indeed any pope who lives in a palace and wears a triple tiara is a strange representative of him who knew not where to lay his head but on the other hand where shall we find anything more beautiful than a francis of assisi a damien among the lepers a cure de ars or indeed any of that host of gentle humble souls who as parish priests missionaries or workers among the poor subordinate their own lives to that of the church it is only fair however to add that all creeds have been associated with some beautiful souls but that none has ever evolved a system so infernal as the inquisition 
my quarrel as i attained my fuller power of mind was not merely with the catholic church though its intolerance was always abhorrent to me it had so much to attract in its tradition and its beauty that i could not conceive myself turning from it to any other form of christian orthodoxy my real quarrel was with that scheme which was common to all churches involving as it does the assumption that man was born with a hereditary stain upon him that this stain for which he was not personally responsible had to be atoned for and that the creator of all things was compelled to make a blood sacrifice of his own innocent son in order to neutralize this mysterious curse i remember reading the phrase an intellectual nightmare as applied to such a system and it echoed my own thought it seemed to me that no heathen tribe had ever conceived so grotesque an idea and i turned away from such a creed and wandered into a darkness which was only dimly lit by my own god-given reason there followed my years of agnosticism i remained a firm believer in god for i clearly saw order in the universe and the existence of order postulates a central intelligence that supreme intelligence was my god but all else i rejected as to the survival of the individual soul it seemed to me that all the argument was against it did this soul not obviously spring from the brain an accident to the brain would affect it and possibly turn a saint into a sinner my medical knowledge assured me of the fact alcohol and many drugs seemed to influence the soul making the individual quarrelsome kindly or exalted was it not clear then that mind sprang from matter how could it survive when matter had dissolved into its chemical atoms the argument seemed final and i was left with no hope and no particular desire it was a valley of gloom with death and extinction waiting at the end there was nothing but plain obvious duty and self-respect as an acting religion then came the strange experiences which slowly made me realize that rational agnosticism is not a terminus of our journey but rather a junction where one changes from an old line on to a new one my mind had hitherto been filled with an ignorant and unreasoning contempt for psychic subjects they ran clean counter to all my views and seemed to me to be half fancy and half fraud but telepathy gave me pause my whole previous case rested upon the supposition that brain produced soul or mind but if the brain could indeed affect another brain at a distance then clearly there was something there which was psychic rather than material i made sure of telepathy by personal experiment it shook the whole fabric of my philosophy and enlarged my ideas of the possible gradually i was drawn into psychic investigation and reading the latter affected me much i read judge edmonds crooks wallace and myers i began to see that the facts were against me and that there was an alternative to my former views i saw that the brain might be something which is acted upon rather than something which acts and that its disorganization by accident or by drugs might prevent such action as the broken fiddle prevents the efforts of the musician i read and read the opponents of psychic things were great men huxley's and kelvin's but they were ready to admit that they had not found time to study the matter on the other hand the advocates of spirit had studied it deeply and spoke of what they had seen but then the phenomena were so childish the messages so futile how could i accept them as being from another world slowly too slowly my knowledge expanded i was hampered always by preconceived prejudice gradually one or two facts emerged one was that these phenomena appeared trivial because i did not appreciate their object a knock at the door is in itself trivial but it draws attention to the person knocking and that may not be trivial what were these rappings save knockings at the door of our intelligence they were signals to engage our attention then as to the character of some of the messages 
if death truly made no change at all in the individual as was asserted by the spiritualists then as the average man or woman is of no very advanced intelligence was it not reasonable that the average message should be superficial one by one my difficulties disappeared while the personal evidence grew ever stronger but it was only in the war time early in nineteen sixteen to be exact that my case was complete and that i was sure then the enormous importance of it overwhelmed my mind the whole world was crying out where are our dead where are those grand young fellows who only yesterday were so full of life and energy i knew where they were i was sure that i knew my wife who had shared the evidence and in consequence the conviction felt as i did together we determined that we should devote the rest of our lives to handing on this knowledge and comfort to others nearly ten years have passed since that resolution and it is stronger with us now than then there is no space here to go into the evidence and it is fully recorded elsewhere but it is to my mind conclusive that those we call dead have long been able to reach us but have found us insensible to their approach it is not merely the reunion with our lost ones which has been effected something much higher has been obtained we have got into contact with virtuous souls long passed over who now correspond to what were called angels from them we get direct religious teaching founded upon actual experience it is in many ways a new conception and yet it has come through to us in many lands and through many instruments it is simple it is reasonable above all it is extraordinarily comforting when once you are convinced of its truth this world holds no terror for you and you look into the future unafraid with no fear of death it tells us of a really merciful god whose rewards are immense and whose judgments are mild of a new world which contains that work and those pleasures which are most congenial to us of a gradual evolution from a lowly paradise to the higher ones of the development of our own natural faculties of homes and family circles and the reunion of all who love even of the lowly animal world with the exclusion of all who jar such is the life beyond as pictured by those who live it but the wonderful thing is that by devious paths we have got back to christianity once more and that the christ figure appears to me at least more beautiful and understandable than ever the worst that any sect can do for christ is to make him incredible now he appeared as a great heaven-sent teacher living a life which was to be our example that was surely enough without any question of a mystical atonement it is not for our mosquito brains to say what degree of divinity was in him but we can surely say that he was nearer the divine than we and that his teaching is the most beautiful of which we have cognizance so in a circle we have come back to him the great kindly brooding spirit who yearns over the whole world which is his special care he has ceased to be a miracle he has become our dear friend and brother such in brief space has been the outcome of my religious evolution is it final i do not know but i do know that what i have is solid even if more should hereafter be added thereto End of chapter four chapter five e phillips oppenheim it is a curious feature of our social and conversational life that the one subject which is of supreme and vital importance to every human being is the least often discussed our thoughts and feelings concerning the hereafter and the shaping of our lives in accordance with our theories or convictions it seems indeed as though the whole world of men as well as women were afflicted with a curious shyness when the subject of religion is even indirectly alluded to 
in these days of bridge and mahjong universal dancing and freer intercourse between the sexes the habitude of conversation between men at their clubs and other meeting places has naturally enough declined yet there are always friendships and with friendship an exchange of views upon all the vital matters of life these continue to some extent yet it is a curious fact that if the conversation between any little company of intellectuals should wander from sport or literature or art to the graver question of a possible hereafter even the most brilliant talkers become tongue-tied there are self-conscious gaps in the flow of speech and there is an universal air of relief when as usually happens before long the subject is changed youth is sometimes bolder and deliberately seeks elucidation of the one ageless impenetrable mystery yet among the middle-aged and elderly there exists almost a cult of silence concerning those problems which science has failed us and which faith in the mystic teachings of the spiritual leaders of the world can alone solve from the earliest dawn of intelligence we walk through life whether our own way lies through the pleasure gardens or across the rugged places along the edge of a mysterious and yawning abyss into whose unfathomable depths we know that some day or other we must commit ourselves there are times times as a rule of solitary thought during which we strain our eyes looking downwards but for the most part we accept our destiny with a curious mixture of fatalism and an ostrich-like capacity for burying our heads in the affairs of the world until the last moment without any hope or fear of the hereafter we should logically become a world of lunatics yet all those forms of faith and belief which from the earliest days of history have produced a countless procession of saints and heroes have grown fainter throughout the generations until to-day it really seems as though in future ages not far removed from our own all established forms of worship will die of sheer inanition it is the penalty which we are paying for a larger measure of intellectual comprehension for greater inroads into the mysterious world of science that with all such developments the primitive faith of men in god grows fainter and fainter centuries ago religion was an easy thing man believed what he felt and what he was taught nowadays when the utilitarianism of a more mechanical world has destroyed to a large extent the earlier and sweeter forms of apprehension born of faith and sentiment religion as expressed by any definite formulae is sinking fast into the background of our lives taking its place among the dead beautiful things whose inspiration is past the mythology of greece the pictured worship of the egyptians it is scarcely our fault it is a matter often when one contemplates the simple joyous lives of past generations for deep and bitter regret that the whole-hearted unquestioning faith with which they accepted the priest expounded explanations of the problems of the universe has in a large measure become impossible to the dwellers in this bustling world of ours impossible whatever effort of will or brain we devote towards its renaissance with it has passed without the shadow of a doubt much of the spirituality of our lives our art has become distorted and uninspired and even our national existence has felt the need of that flame of idealism which gave it color and force the materialist today has come into his own yet the greatest skeptic has to admit that there is implanted in us from some unknown source together with our other inherent proclivities certain aspirations towards a world morality the cultivation of which brings us a measure of content and happiness which we can gain by no other means my religion is the religion of the man in the street an attitude of i hope reverent ignorance as regards the great unsolved problems of life and death 
but a desire as one looks upward in vain to pass through one's day-by-day -day life believing that in one's own fellow-creatures there must be a spark of that divinity which elsewhere eludes us an inclination always to accept the most charitable view of a fellow-creature's misdoings to believe the best of every one with whom one is brought into contact and to help so far as one can those who are confronted with graver problems of life than we ourselves are called upon to meet there seems to be no other religion left to-day for the thinking man but to worship the unknown god through his fellows fulfilling thereby a primitive and inherent instinct we are few of us heroes we all have our weaknesses but it is always possible in yielding to them to sacrifice as little as may be the happiness of others the struggle to keep our place in life is forced upon us but we may fight for our own hand and still retain a measure of consideration for those whose interests clash with our own we are fundamentally selfish by the logic of necessity forced into an attitude of self-preservation by the laws of life still at the cost of a little thought we can carry on the fight without undue hurt to others with some blending indeed of altruistic effort if the shadows of the great abyss reveal to us nothing of what may lie beneath their terrifying embrace the best preparation for the inevitable end in the absence of that rare gift of absolute faith would seem to be the conviction earned by continual effort that the happiness of one's fellow creatures had been rather added to than marred by one's passage through life End of chapter five chapter six compton mackenzie it would have been a much easier task for me to write about my religion if i could have invented a religion of my own to expound but i am a catholic and a man might as well try to circumnavigate the globe in a paper boat as hope to circumscribe the catholic faith within a thousand words fortunately however the catholic church is not at the mercy of an individual apologist her dogmas rest upon something firmer than the shifting sands of scientific theories in no galilean cave will any enthusiastic young paleontologist find the skull of jesus christ and therefore make it advisable for theologians to change the date of the incarnation by a trifle of twenty thousand years let me hasten to add that i am not presuming to sneer at science an obscurantist attitude to science is as repulsive as a smoking lamp the more i devote my reason to the study of nature and the less i surrender my emotion to the contemplation of art the more firmly do i believe in what the curiously feeble terminology of metaphysics calls the absolute and the more clearly do i perceive that only within the catholic church can i hope dimly to apprehend that absolute it is encouraging for instance to read in dr jean's lecture to the royal society on february fifteenth nineteen twenty four that our sun is situated fairly near the centre of the fifteen hundred million stars that make up the known universe after the scorn that has been expended on the folly of medieval man in supposing that he was the centre of the universe and that his earth was something quite definitely extraordinary the tidal theory of cosmogony advanced by dr jeans restores some of my anthropocentric complacency for the moment that theory seems unassailable yet belief in it paradoxically requires an effort of faith in the improbable even more severe than the effort demanded for the improbable fact of the incarnation i am not trying to lighten the ship by flinging the cargo overboard after the fashion of modernists or broad churchmen or whatever they choose to call themselves when the theories of science appear positively to conflict with the teachings of the church i prefer to wait until the church decides before i commit myself to accepting any theory be it never so attractive 
dear wise ray lancaster communion with whose profound knowledge and beautiful common sense is one of the pleasures of contemporary existence once told me that he could not understand how i had managed so completely to surrender my individual judgment as to profess catholicism it would be insincere to pretend that i cannot imagine a conflict between my reason and the authority of the church that may develop at any moment all i can affirm now is that my reason has not yet been called upon to struggle with my faith after all the church allows the individual mind a much greater liberty of speculation than is generally supposed what she does not allow is any attempt by the individual to speculate for others the classic instance of apparent fallibility is the condemnation of the copernican system but it must be remembered that it was really the astronomers of the time who were so urgent and unanimous in their defense of the ptolemaic system a parallel case at the present day would be to ask the church to decide at once whether or not dr jean's tidal cosmogony has superseded the celestial mechanics of laplace the strength of the chain is its weakest link and the conservatism of the church is continually being justified will any man of common sense who has studied the fragmentary history of mankind blame the caution of the church in always being more ready to condemn than to approve let it be remembered that she has been equally slow to approve the novelties of the theological speculation the theory of the immaculate conception took over eight hundred years to become a dogma and though the assumption of the blessed virgin mary is celebrated as one of the major feasts belief in it as an historical fact is still no more than a pious opinion to touch for a moment on the political aspect of catholicism we hear a great deal about the wickedness of the church in the past and our flesh is invited to creep at the thought of priestcraft well a decent anti-clericalism is not unbecoming to a catholic and few of us are prepared to claim too much for the priesthood which it may be remarked is only a small part of the church no doubt in the middle ages the tyranny of the priests was dangerous and unpleasant yet i venture to think that the tyranny of lawyers by which it was replaced was equally dangerous and unpleasant and i am not sure but that the tyranny of doctors with which we are now threatened will be the most dangerous and unpleasant of all i am certainly prepared to maintain that the abuses of psychoanalysis already exceed by far the sum total of the abuses of the confessional for which it is an inadequate and pretentious substitute i see no hope for the future of western civilization unless it return to the political ideals of the middle ages if i had not been a papist before the war i should have been driven into becoming one by the war alone the church preserved her integrity during that mundane epilepsy to my eyes which many people might consider as ineffective as stained glass windows for clarity of vision the formation of the league of nations is no better than a half-hearted compromise with the ideals of catholicism a typist dream of the holy roman empire for politicians a new hypocrisy for diplomats a sitting of addled eggs had i the strength of mind to divorce myself entirely from the present i might find my salvation in the study of mathematics my worship in listening to the music of bach and my pleasure in reading the poetry of lucretius as it is incapable of such a starry remoteness i find in the catholic faith that common humanity which fortifies me against the horrors of a twentieth-century existence did i possess the requisite credulity i might seek consolation and assurance in spiritualism but my reason revolts less from a belief in the resurrection of the body than from a belief in ectoplasm and if i had to fancy a postman's eternity for myself after death an endless rat-tatting on easily manipulated tables i would prefer to be granted a certain faith in my ultimate obliteration all that humanity can believe all that humanity can hope 
all that humanity can love i find in catholicism our minds have been so lately stunned by the noise of war that we do not yet apprehend what a much more tremendous spiritual contest is preparing it may be that the historian of a thousand years hence will consider the creation of the irish free state a more important date than august nineteen fourteen because ireland may ultimately prove to be the first political expression of the finer civilization that by the mercy of god shall emerge from that immense struggle already looming it will be observed that hitherto i have not used the word christianity in this article that is because i believe that within a comparatively short time catholicism and christianity will once more mean the same thing in that great spiritual struggle even an ulsterman may have to beat his drum in honour of the pope if he wants to drive antichrist out of ulster putting on one side those intimations of divinity that no man should be expected to proclaim thus casually as it were i am a christian because without christianity i should be so much perplexed by the riddle of life that i could not wait another moment to solve it i am a catholic because only in catholicism does my sceptical mind perceive a rational exegesis and a practical synthesis of christianity if i have appeared bigoted and contentious my bigotry and contentiousness must be forgiven because anybody who believes ardently is bound to disbelieve with equal ardour and if i did not believe and disbelieve with a deep conviction that i was believing what was true and disbelieving what was false i should never have allowed my voice to be heard at this symposium of testimony End of chapter six chapter seven j d beersford the changes in my own attitude to religion have followed generally and in a condensed form the broader movements of thought during the past century i was brought up in a country rectory and my father was a low churchman of the old school in those years i believed in hell as firmly as i believed in god or the wisdom of my own parents i was in short a fair representative of the average churchgoer of the early and mid-victorian period the first breath of doubt crossed my mind when i was just twenty-one and so strong a breath was it that in a single evening i came over as it were into the scepticism of the later part of the nineteenth century begotten by the works of darwin huxley and tyndall i reached too the same climax of absolute materialism and then like so many others entered on another phase of reaction as a result of reading haeckel's riddle of the universe in which matter was so triumphantly proved to possess all the potentialities hitherto attributed to god that it really made little difference whether one believed in the god of matter or a material god the further stages that mark the subtler movements of thought cannot be followed in an article of this length they include the examination and rejection of the phenomena of spiritualism so far as the evidence for actual messages from the dead is concerned the opposition to modern occultist thought is that it omits an essential to development by too great a concentration on the self and last a tendency to find in recent science strong support for the purely mystical attitude inasmuch as the further our researches are pressed into the constitution of matter the more we find it becoming resolved into an aspect of force which is merely a name for anything you please but though we may enlarge our conception of god to any extent forsaking that early notion of him as a kind of jealous patriarch and judge extraordinarily quick-tempered where his own rules are concerned and assuming him as the essential spirit of the whole universe we the inhabitants of this one small planet are compelled by the accident of our present condition to consider religion from the point of view of its influence on our day-to-day -day existence now whatever may be our conception of life after death whether indeed we believe in it or not 
the whole experience of mankind seems to show that the true practice of religion enforces before all else an element of self-denial in all forms of the christian religion this element is found in avoiding the temptation of what has been clearly defined for us as sin in hindu buddhism and occultism generally the necessity for self-denial as a means to self-development is pushed to an extreme asceticism but even in the most primitive of savage cults we find this root principle of denying ourselves something that we desire this then is what i have come to believe in as the meaning of religion as such the element of faith as a means to the practice of self-restraint since this is the common factor of all creeds from this it will be inferred that i do not disapprove the principles of christianity nor do i i regard the ethics of christ as being beyond all comparison the most admirable rule of life ever given to the world but i have never seen that ethic practised by the members of any christian community with which i have been associated moreover the dogmas of the churches appear to me to be utterly at variance with the spirit of christ to take the most obvious of many examples i can find no warrant in christ's teaching for the doctrine that a man shall find salvation only by following the particular articles of belief adopted by one particular sect or division of the christian church the clearest statement that christ made in this connection was he that believeth on me shall not perish and i choose to accept that at once in its simplest and widest significance not as implying he that believes in an endless rigmarole of senseless ordinances and ritual originally imposed by priests for their own purposes but as he that believes in the divine principle in himself and all mankind if we could indeed accept that single faith as the basis of a great world religion all our controversies would be blown away and the whole life of man would have to be reorganized no matter in what creed i was educated if i believe in this divine principle in myself and act always as if i so believe i should be compelled to lead a religious life to do anything less would be to deny my faith and relinquish the hope of eternal life but at the present stage of our evolution this one simple creed with the enormous responsibilities and need for self-discipline that it necessitates is a world too hard for the average man and woman if we could truly believe in god not as a distant superhuman judge whom we must presently confront but as inhabiting instantly and forever our own mind we should be incapable of acting unworthily every mean selfish cruel cowardly intolerant act would then be a denial of our great faith and would indeed re-crucify that spirit of christ which is still seeking to incarnate itself in all humanity this then in conclusion is what religion means to me the belief that god seeks to express himself in us not by a slavish adherence to some trifling form of worship but by the practice of a principle which was incorporated by christ in the words thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself but who as yet is capable of obeying that tremendous commandment the essence of all true religious practice End of chapter seven chapter eight israel zangwill it is a sunday morning in the temple my laundress who has sacrificed to me her one morning of rest with a maternal devotion that recalls the constant service of the ancient world and proves that despite bolshevist organs kind hearts may still be beneath cheap blouses has returned to the remote bosom of her family after a feverish week of wrestling with theatrical folk and businessmen i am alone the church bells are ringing and though i was born a jew and know that the original templars on the day they captured jerusalem and the tomb of christ in one of their crusades slew every jew man woman and child 
i would willingly quit the work of writing this to sit in the temple church but even as it is the glorious music soars up to my tree-shadowed study and i rejoice that although the crowd will be standing to-night in long patient queues outside the film palaces of the strand noble buildings still exist wherein an ever-dwindling minority can hear the inspired words of the ancient jews in the almost equally inspired jacobean english and although i myself can rest no day at all these weeks i am glad that this day of repose should have been given to the toiling masses through the medium of the mosaic code and while i would cut them off from no open-air recreation i think that they no less than their so-called betters stand to lose by the abandonment of all ritual save that of the dance hall and the night club i can forgive wells much when i recall that in his history of the world he has done something if far from everything to put isaiah and amos in their places as the greatest factors in civilization it is true bossuet had long ago made all history turn round the jewish but that was superstition whereas wells's view is provable we moderns must be open says the villain or as his already belated disciples would style him the hero of my latest play but on religion who to-day is open only those whose minds are closed be they ultra pietists or atheists both forms of extremists are brainless but the immemorial instinct of mankind would justify the former rather than the latter though democracy has proved itself as despicable as aristocracy there is still safety in numbers and tradition orthodoxy makes also for happiness and with all my larger opportunities and means my life has probably been less enviable than that of my penurious father who in his old age left his home and family to die in jerusalem it is unfortunate nevertheless that the orthodox bear out the only truth that oscar wilde has contributed to thought to wit that each man kills the thing he loves i remember in my school days a boy pouncing on a contradiction in the bible and at once disbelieving in the whole book but of course the bible is not a book because it is all bound together a literature covering seven or eight centuries is mistaken for a single volume this is christianity's fault the only book the bible resembles is an anthology for this mixture of magnificence and myth was called from the literature of israel by an editorial board the old testament is a chosen book more certainly than the jews are a chosen people there was no need for my friend sir james fraser to point out the savage elements of this book they leap to the eye the real need is to point out that despite the later appendix called the new testament these savage elements still exist in christendom and never more brazenly than since the war to end war ended the peace of mankind it is now the common duty of all civilized men of every creed to find the next religion to quote the title of my still prohibited play of nineteen twelve there is very little real difference among the higher creeds of to-day even between such apparent opposites as roman catholicism and judaism what keeps them apart is largely the economic factor jesus in that punning mood to which he like the other ancient hebrew prophets of whom he was the latest and greatest example was prone told peter he was founding his church on a rock the rock his church is really founded on as i remark in my italian fantasies is a gold reef these salarize the creeds and you will soon unify them but of course money though it petrifies religion is not its real source and though it perpetuates the differences between religions these differences are not insignificant but in practice they are reduced or even eliminated by the common nature of every man everywhere the founders of religion are supermen and as a character in one of my novels remarks it is only by being misunderstood that a great man can influence his kind 
we see this in the sudden acceptance of bernard shaw by the church-going classes because of his saint joan and despite his unflinchingly analytical preface to the text to me he seemed from the first a sort of comic christ even before i had the privilege of his friendship i could see the love and pity behind the wilfully brazen boomster but if he does not die in the odor of sybil thorndyke's sanctity it will be because he subsequently read that little masterpiece o'flaherty v c on the wireless i myself though that alone is no proof of greatness have been equally misunderstood it takes two you see to make a truth and though by marrying out of the fold i tried to make it clear that to me judaism was not racial i failed to get the idea over jewry thought i had made a mixed marriage a form of union i utterly disapprove of the fact being that the englishwoman who honoured me by becoming my wife was essentially at one with me but as pascal says the heart has reasons of which the head is ignorant and by some inarticulate instinct the jewish masses the world over still believed in me as a racial jew and followed me as they still insist on following me i cannot complain since jehovah himself was pictured by the pious as clad in praying shawl and phylacteries and the same fate has overtaken dr herzl the founder of modern zionism who often brought me his problems to this very room two decades before lord rothschild sir herbert samuel or alfred mond who in those days might have been so useful had discovered their passion for palestine so little racial am i that i have not made my eldest born a son of the covenant i cannot with my vision and knowledge of history carry on the nineteenth-century old tradition of trying to sit between two stools before the war a might avail jew offered to send a five-pound note to any charity i pleased if i will tell him if my son was circumcised i was sorry to rob a charity but i left the inquisitive letter unanswered if the writer is still alive as i hope he can send the fiver to the jewish refugees stranded by pitiless america's immigration policy i will add and he may perhaps rise to a tenor at the glad news that my younger son is circumcised but that was only because the doctor advised it circumcision has in fact become so popular a prophylactic that it can no longer connote the covenanted isolation of the jew were jewry in earnest in fulfilling its vaunted mission it would rejoice at this removal of the greatest stumbling block to the spread of its religion i cannot too much admire those masses of romans who in the times of tacitus and juvenal were not deterred from judaism even by a surgical operation in the pre-chloroform period but in our day if judaism is ever to create the world of its millennial dream it must perform a surgical operation on itself and cut away all that clogs and hinders its vitalizing activity it must recognize that bryanism like poor bryan himself is dead and that the old testament is as far from finality as the new which judaism should now add to it what the next religion should be exactly i have tried to answer in the spirit of renan who in a preface to one of his plays urged that only drama giving through its personages even opposite answers can give the full reply to any real human question simplicity in statement is possible only to journalists and politicians themselves cunningly complex thus doubly the theatre may claim to replace the dying church i have been compelled to refer to my own books because alone among the contributors to this series unless dear old conan doyle's fantasies are to be reckoned a contribution to the subject i seem not to have waited for editorial prompting to bear my heart on religion apart from my play with that great word in its very title i have dealt with the subject in my book of verse blind children and especially in my bulky book 
the voice of jerusalem my very first sonnet published when i was sixteen in an organ called society now extinct like most of the papers i have been connected with began the glamour of deceit is over all we prize in the stars that seem with love to glow are huge black worlds the inward god gleam dies and hearts shut up as flowers when sunlight flies and not many years later i published in another extinct organ called progress a poem that still seems to me to sum up all that shaw and wells have said and which had already been anticipated by john stuart mill as to god's lack of omnipotence since then i at least have become less omniscient a line in my murdered tragedy the war god have you experience then in making worlds seems worth pondering at the end of my dreamers of the ghetto you may find a poem called jehovah which still represents my views as well as a passionate outburst which must have anticipated pragmatism in a vast american anthology called the world's great religious poetry the bulk of which appears to have been written recently in america i am represented by three pieces but the tiny quatrain in my blind children still seems to me to express a final truth who armed us with righteous meeting rod by which our trust in heavenly love grows dim the fact that you and i despair of god is common ground for hope and trust in him wells and shaw are modern manichaeans but possibly the last word remains with the bold utterance of isaiah i create good and i create evil i am the lord but even this view of religion cannot blind us to the fact that life remains a tragic comic mystery and that a god without a sense of humour as i was before dean ing in saying would be to that extent our inferior i agree with the hero of the next religion in his doctrine of one world at a time and in his view that if we fail to turn our planet into a paradise no power outside us will do it i do not share the megalomaniac view of my friends maeterlinck shaw or wells that we shall ever be able to steer our planet through space as for einstein's view of space true or not i regard it as relatively unimportant a future life is unthinkable but not therefore impossible and there are not a few people i should love to see again or to atone to though it seems pointless if they are transmogrified beyond recognition as for the idea of back to methuselah although human life is extending that can at best alter only the ratios at six hundred i feel i should have the same old foibles as i find in myself at sixty but if by science or otherwise we have the right to prolong life we have also the right to end it war cannot have a monopoly of the right to kill peace must also have its lethal rights under rigid safeguards of course but agonized incurables must be relieved of their agony in the famous conversation between george eliot and f w h myers who though the founder of the psychical society has failed deplorably to communicate with his followers that great but now somewhat obscured victorian authoress held forth duty as all-sufficient for the spiritual life i would rather phrase it that our guiding stars in the darkness of the infinite spaces should be not only duty but loving-kindness pity and courage i have always regretted that arnold bennett annexed the title the great adventure to an insignificant play because that is the only phrase for the life of the universe and our own end of chapter eight chapter nine h de vere stackpole one morning a great many years ago the congregation of the mariners church which is in kingston ireland had settled into their pews for the sermon 
it was before i was born but i can see them in imagination these irish protestant victorians the light streaming upon them through the tall narrow windows the silence broken by an occasional cough or the snap of a vinaigrette the parson above them proceeding with his discourse the children nudged to make them behave suddenly a whisper ran through the church passing from pew to pew heads turned a man stood up and the congregation rising stampeded leaving the parson and his discourse literally in the air news had come that the queen's yacht was in sight it was queen victoria's second visit to ireland and these good people did not i am sure cast religion to the winds in their eagerness to satisfy a consuming curiosity but just convention the same convention that took me as an unwilling child through the sundays of many a long year to the same church to sit bored through many a long sermon unable to cut it short because no queen's yacht was in sight convention i imagine takes a good many people to church but of this i am sure that it takes all or nearly all children for i cannot imagine a normal child washing itself and dressing itself in its best and proceeding of its own free will to sit for an hour and a half in a stiff pew listening to a service it can only partly understand a service that enjoins it among other things to pray that it may be saved from the sin of coveting its neighbour's wife of murder and of adultery i am just talking out of my own experience as a child the words god religion church sunday clergyman all became related and each expressive of something i did not care for something to do with form and stiff collars something i could not understand something mirthless limb stiffening and at times terrifying as when they sang that frightful hymn which includes the lines oh what eternal horrors hang around that second death i am not arguing against church-going for adults i am only saying in the course of these remarks and saying with conviction that the english church service is not adapted for children and that the taking of a child to church as a matter of convention sunday after sunday is not the surest way to induce in its mind the love of god but perhaps the surest way to induce the fear of him as a wretched disciplinarian a person before whom it is wicked to shuffle one's feet or smile and who may treat one not at all in a fatherly fashion the terrible threat of hell would have haunted my childhood only for the fact that i did not consider it fully i had other things to consider including lessons and marbles and mackerel fishing in dublin bay also i had the feeling that the threat of eternal punishment for finite sins was a bogey put up to frighten me not by god but by my elders and betters in the course of many years i have not altered this opinion substituting for elders and betters the heads of the churches of the past for in the course of these years i have seen the church make a half turn from the position it adopted towards the sinner when i was a child hell is not preached to-day as it was in those days and in consequence perhaps the church of convention has partly lost its hold upon the public while at the same time the religion of fear has departed for many of us and given place to a new religion which teaches us that though a god surely exists we can by no means visualize him it is the attempt to depict god as a person a superior sort of clergyman with the attribute of a magistrate and a schoolmaster a hanging judge and a loving father that i am sure has been accountable for a great deal of the growth of disbelief and the birth of the age of reason among ordinary men disbelief in the conventional creed of our forefathers belief on lines more rational and understandable belief in good and evil belief that in clinging to good as far as in us lies is the best form of worship of the spirit of good and in avoiding evil as far as in us lies the best means of fighting the spirit of evil 
i think very likely we who hold this simple faith are limited even pure blend but there are men so much above us that they have the power to come into closer touch with the great spirit i just speak for myself and i am sure many like me and when i call it a simple faith i do not mean that it is easy of observance for it implies in its recognition of good not only good in its personal application but in its application to others the recognition in fact of the rights of man this teaching is in the bible but in some extraordinary way it was never set free from the churches and conventicles till recent years and then it was released i suspect not by the parsons but the congregations redeemed by education from the deadening clutch of formalism and creed the result has been almost unthinkable on march seventh eighteen eighteen at the lincolnshire lent assizes his majesty's judges and their sheriff all pillars of the church and state murdered in cold blood by hanging twelve unfortunate men guilty of thefts or small offences scarce worthy of a ten shilling fine or a month's imprisonment in october eighteen thirty in bedford jail was murdered by hanging a boy almost a child for the act of putting a light to a hayrick two of a million facts that point to a recent past so terrible that contrasted with the present the mind is led to say surely christ has come to the world again perhaps he has i do not know but of this i am assured that the world of england to-day despite its supposed irreligion and the emptying of our churches is now more permeated than ever it has been by the spirit of clemency and justice by the hatred of cruelty and oppression and the determination at all events among the masses that there shall be equal rights for all men but we have still a long way to go End of chapter nine chapter ten henry arthur jones i was brought up in the rigorous creed of english puritanism i am grateful for it as i believe that puritanism offers a firm basis for building up strong solid and sincere character i was forced to read and study the bible constantly and on this count also i acknowledge an immense debt to puritanism those strange and beautiful and deeply human books have been my classics but i am equally grateful that i was able to make an early escape from puritanism till i was twenty i accepted almost without question the creed that i had been taught i had never been what my co-religionist called converted for there is no need in my nature for crude and luscious spiritual experience i kept a hard belief in the cast-iron dogmas that had been hammered into my head all through my childhood the business i was engaged in allowed me long stretches of leisure and i was a wide and diligent reader science and poetry i loved most but i read a good deal of fiction no thoughtful man in those years could avoid being drawn into the currents of controversy between the new affirmations of science and the old affirmations of orthodox christianity i eagerly examined the arguments on both sides and was swayed towards darwin huxley and mill i carefully studied herbert spencer's synthetic philosophy it has largely influenced my after thinking though philosophic thought has passed aside from herbert spencer he remains a clear solid thinker and a sure corrective to the wild loose fallacies of socialism i read the leading apologists of that day with a strong reaction of dissent newman i received gladly with sensitive delight in the moulds of his language with great admiration for his dialectic with wonder to see this lofty subtle intellect entangling itself in naive incredulities and with not a particle of agreement in his main positive conclusions but he who chiefly propped my mind and steered my course in those days was matthew arnold i may gratefully dwell upon the memory of my close friend the rev t w chignall the unitarian minister at exeter a cousin of mark rutherford 
although he had thrown away all dogma his was one of the most religious minds that i have held in communion together we found great religious support in matthew arnold if to-day i were asked for the clearest expression of my religious belief so far as i have a belief that can be formulated i should find it in that long courageous song of empedocles with its final note i say fear not life still leaves human effort scope but since life seems with ill nurse no extravagant hope because thou must not dream thou needst not then despair arnold constantly sends out the loftiest and most invigorating religious strains and impulses those who are doubting and baffled may go to him for help he will not offer them a hard definite creed but he will spiritually fortify them he is not for those who seek an anodyne but for those who need a tonic to brace them to endurance arnold is the surest and strongest and most fearless religious teacher of our time we can lean upon him and face the darkness with him tennyson and browning never went through the darkness they saw the deep black cave that opened before mankind when orthodox christianity shook and cracked under the assaults of science they entered the cave of doubt made extensive excursions in it and came back reporting that on the whole it was better to abide safely on this side in the comfort of cheerful and spacious generalities matthew arnold did go fearlessly right through the darkness and came out on the other side strengthened and assured since those years in the seventies when to the best of my power i diligently searched into the truth of these things i have never been able to accept the dogmas of orthodox christianity not even to save my soul will i teach my tongue to say over forms of words that have no meaning to me my mind offers a swift instinctive repugnance to all statements of fact that i cannot analyze and understand neither in religion nor in politics nor in art will i bewilder and deceive myself by repeating formulas that i cannot break up into their constituent parts so that i may reassemble them in an intelligible unity of thought before admitting them to a permanent place in the furniture of my mind it will be argued that the cardinal dogmas of christianity are matters of faith but they are issued to me as definite statements of fact and as such they are imposed upon believers what moral impulse and quickening what spiritual illumination and ardor what assurance and consolation in this dim world can i obtain by repeating statements of fact which merely baffle and puzzle me and which i must not question but must receive as matters of faith from my early manhood until a few years ago i called myself an agnostic i was never wholly sucked into the invading tide of materialistic thought that followed the publication of the origin of species if in my struggle to gain firm land i swallowed much of its wash i always managed to keep my eyes above its mountainous waves our civilization to-day nourishes a large and increasing amount of hideous coarse materialism but there is i think a sensible decline in materialistic philosophy and affirmation some fine and high-tuned souls have found a resting place in spiritualism they have amassed an overwhelming amount of evidence that manifestations of a power beyond our seeing do actually take place much of this evidence is questionable some of it is incredible but much of it has great weight is difficult to discredit and impossible to disprove i am more curious about the scientific aspects of spiritualism than about its religious aspects as a religion it does not satisfy my needs i cannot develop a true religious feeling towards it the future existence that it promises has no allurement to me without denying it or ridiculing it i cannot find suitable accommodation for it in my scheme of things i cannot make it fit into the macrocosm quite contentedly i can absent myself 
from its extremely tenuous felicity and linger here to commune with my earthly companions and enjoy with them the light of the sun while i have many absorbing tasks of present concern to fill my days i push aside the business of investigating spiritualism i am far less concerned about what is going to happen to me in eternity than about what is going to happen to this country in the next ten or twenty years if the new heaven of spiritualism is veritable scientific topography i look back with affectionate memories to the vanished new jerusalem of my childhood with its spotless white raiment and angels waving wings and harps of gold we don't get such fine weather as we used to get in the days of charles the second addison's old squire complained to his crony i echo that we don't get such fine solid mansions in the skies socialist and spiritualist as we used to get in the days of good queen victoria my dear friend arthur conan doyle to whose earnestness and truth-seeking crystal sincerity i pay the warmest tribute will forgive me if i lag out of his company immersed as i am in the affairs of this world that give me little respite to lay up for myself treasures in heaven whatever call to wander in strangely haunted spheres of ether or fields of asphodel in new modes of being amid new duties and new pleasures whatever call to prolong and fulfil its existence my spirit may obey when it has earned its release from the flesh it is to this earth that it turns and returns and passionately clings to-day this earth that is the mother of all that i know and feel this earth where i have lived and sinned and suffered and loved and fought and stumbled and triumphed and despaired and laughed and wept and eaten my fill and drunk deep draughts of pleasure and success and bitter cups of misery and defeat and shame this earth whose dawns and sunsets and variegated pageantries are nicely suited to my eyes and her harmonies and discords exactly tuned to my ears this earth whose biting winds and angry hailstorms have buffeted me but whose sunny skies and blue halcyon days have restored me this very earth the only place where my foot finds firm standing and where my spirit feels itself at home only in the degree that any promised or imagined paradise offers to renew the conditions and experiences and activities of this present mortal life and to restore its associations does it win me to desire its hospitality and then only as a last resort a refuge from dissolution a chilly exchange from this pleasing anxious being this palpable breathing world where beating hearts make music to beating hearts and where love and friendship clasp no shadows but warm human flesh and blood still i will snatch as much as i can from annihilation and i shall find no paradise intolerable if arthur conan doyle is there on its threshold to welcome me meantime i have had no slightest personal revelation of anything outside the everyday course of events nor am i inquisitive to communicate with loved ones who have gone from me i am disinclined to invoke agencies that claim a power to bridge the gulf that separates me from the dead i would rather imagine them to be at rest and not vexed about the happenings of this world it would give me no happiness to know that i was certain to receive a spirit communication to-night rather i should feel uneasiness and discomfort i am content to hold communion in my own soul with their memories who have been my dearest earthly companions but i will accept all authentic evidence of their continued existence that is offered directly to my own senses and that i can subject to proof i will not go out of my way to seek it what then is my religion to-day what positive definite creed have i wherewith to fortify and cheer myself and light my feet in my few remaining years as i go down to the nobility of death descending to the shadows have i any encouraging words to call back to them who are following me down that same beaten path 
it is only in late years that we have learned from science that each of us lives not as we supposed in a tenement of clay but in a tenement of electrons matter has been resolved into force but this force is everywhere intelligent foreseeing orderly directory purposeful in its manifestations whether it majestically swings our earth round the sun in a mathematically calculated orbit whether it supervises the fall of a sparrow or whether with the same unerring precision it commands the infinitesimal rings of movement in every atom but is this force not blind and malignant when it hurts or punishes or destroys me no i must not ascribe to it my purposes and my preferences whether the tiny phagocyte expels the poison from my blood and saves me or whether the deadly microbe instills the poison and kills me there is a like purpose and intelligence directing their microscopic activities how can i call that design which shapes and animates the clumsy work of man and not call that design which shapes and animates the infinitely perfect forms and movements in every cranny of this universe how can i call that spirit which inhabits my flesh and directs my movements and not call that spirit which inhabits this universal frame of things and directs its movements however we may name this pervading force however we may imagine or apprehend it we cannot without abolishing our conceptions of design and intelligence nay without abolishing the very words themselves deny that design and intelligent are the creators the sustainers and the sovereign dictators of this universe it is impossible to acknowledge that there is design in any part or section of this universe in any work of man or of nature and then to rail off that section as an oasis and a preserve from chaos if design and intelligence operate anywhere and in anything then they must necessarily operate everywhere and in all things from the march of the stars to the finest rhythm of the smallest atom is that determinism in defiance of it i instinctively assert my free will because i am conscious of exercising my free will i cannot dare not abdicate my responsibility if i try to escape from it conscience and remorse stand ready to arrest me whence come these compunctious visitings as lady macbeth calls them if not from the power beyond our seeing that with design and intelligence compels the universe is there a paradox here there is a dilemma how can i escape from it i will perform an act of faith because i have no alternative i will trust this power that is beyond my comprehending unless i perform this act of faith i cannot steadfastly and courageously continue my earthly pilgrimage i am justified because i am thereby helped and strengthened and made equal with my fate this act of faith is wholly different from the mechanical repetition of a form of words which i cannot understand which it is sought to impose upon me as an act of faith and which is indeed nothing more than an emission of sounds from the tongue a placebo like the comforting pronouncement of the blessed word mesopotamia we cannot comprehend this intangible power it is not stuff that our senses can handle and dissect i do not understand what is meant by a personal god the phrase brings me up against a blank wall so far as i can understand what is meant by it it seems to me a contradiction in terms when it is used i recall the psalmist rebuke thou thoughtest that i was altogether such an one as thyself but i will reprove thee we cannot comprehend that power but it insists that we shall apprehend it matter has been resolved into force and every manifestation of that force shows arrangement design intelligence force power spirit we are using large indefinite synonyms are they not all the same the only reality the ultimate reality out of which all things are spun 
our own bodies as well as every other compound of electrons i believe that all this vast universe is living intelligent spirit in its every tiniest atom i believe that we can rest in its faithfulness and punctuality it is not a lying spirit it is a truthful and honest spirit facing and accepting all the angriest convulsions and hurricanes of that universal spirit facing and accepting all the woes and disasters and diseases and brutalities and blinding sorrows that it visits upon us facing and accepting all the torments of the flesh and agonies of the mind that man endures i believe there is yet a great balance of sentient happiness and joy and beauty and interpenetrating the cosmos to its utmost limit i discern an infrangible law compelling all its atoms in one long march of unity and order of purpose to secure that balance of happiness and joy and beauty when wordsworth declared that every flower enjoyed the air it breathed he was not using a poet's license but stating a scientific fact may we not divine intrinsic spirit in those dust grains of the clods of the field which seeds of wheat shall intelligently clasp and shall endow with vegetable life and that having been garnered and become foodstuff shall then be intelligently drawn into my blood and thence shall be intelligently appointed to the chief office in my brain there to burn with love and adoration is there spirit in me and not in that grain of dust which is qualifying itself to become the noblest part of me in what obscurest nook or recess of matter in what rock or plant or animal or man shall we search and shall not find there the home of the living spirit that men call god thou hast beset me behind and before whither shall i go from thy spirit or whither shall i free from thy presence if i ascend up into heaven thou art there if i make my bed in hell behold thou art there if i take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea even there thy hand shall lead me and thy right hand shall guide me how the old words fit our mouths and lift our hearts to-day if we do not basely put them to literal use if we do not harden them into dead benumbing incredible statements of fact it is the fate of all creeds ultimately to petrify religion the letter strangles the spirit let us not submit ourselves to the despotism of dead forms of words equally having thrown off the fetters of dogma let us not ignobly seek refuge in amiable generalities and vasty vagueness and that balmy optimism which is equally meaningless with the dogmas that we have rejected thus i am led in the company of many of the deepest and devoutest minds of all times to pantheism to that large simple faith which finds poetic expression in paul's words to the athenians he giveth to all life and breath and all things that they should seek the lord if haply they might feel after him and find him though he be not far from any one of us for in him we live and move and have our being my creed is not a full rich seductive creed like roman catholicism embroidered with golden legends and spangled and painted with gorgeous imageries it is a narrow plank but i find it sure under my feet i tread onwards with no misgiving i pray to that living universal spirit not expecting it to work miracles for me not to command scarcely to beseech but that i may be drawn into aspiring communion with that power whose abundant life gave me life and gives me more life whose inexhaustible strength gives me new strength that i may keep perfect step and tune with its laws and that i may thereby gain increased faith courage patience hope and self-control my prayers do not fall into the void for i rise refreshed invigorated and assured i am not distressed about immortality i cannot clearly enough picture to myself 
any future state of being that will be so different from this present state that i feel obliged to make special preparation and do extra packing for it my ordinary everyday spiritual luggage will suffice me to carry me through the journey however long it may be i am not building upon immortality but i will joyfully receive it if it is conferred upon me such is my religion is it meagre is it chilly is it pagan is it a religion at all it is true for me it is enough for me i can live by it at seventy-four i can face death without a fear i do indeed shrink from a wearisome dying the drawn-out pain the trouble and inconvenience to myself and to those that wait to see me pass but of death itself i have not the least dread let me not say a word in rebuke to them whose habit or nature demands a vast architectural scheme of dogma and incomprehensibility the operative part of any man's religion is that which he weaves for himself out of his own spiritual experience the unseen power whose eyes forever doth accompany mankind hath looked on no religion scornfully which man did ever find which hath not taught weak wills how much they can which hath not fallen on the heart like rain which hath not said to sunk self-weary man thou must be born again we cannot rest in a materialistic interpretation of the universe the last creed that i can accept is that which affirms the spirit of man to be a transitory emanation from dead matter and resolving it back into dead matter accuses the universe of being a huge trick organized by futility and nothingness to delude and defeat mankind we refuse to deify futility and nothingness the spirit of man will always throw up to heaven its triumphant affirmation though he slay me yet will i trust in him end of chapter ten chapter eleven the unknown man it has been a real inspiration and joy to read the articles by well-known writers on their religious beliefs which are included in my religion i think mr walpole is correct when he says if you were to question nine out of ten grown men and women of to-day as to their religious experience they would describe to you an evolution through three stages of discovery first the child's acceptance of the dogmas handed over to it by its elders second the adolescent's reaction against that acceptance and third the evolution of some positive personal opinion born of personal experience i have quoted these words of mr walpole because they do exactly sum up my own experience an experience which has brought me back to the christ and to christianity through a period of bewildering doubt and agnosticism what mr arnold bennett does not seem to realize is that many of us have gambled the whole of our lives on the side of religion with no more of an intellectual certainty than he exhibits that is to say on the balance of probability to accept belief in a mind behind the universe which is working out a purpose for good in and through that universe on the same balance of probability to accept the theory of a future life and the likelihood that our conduct in this life will materially affect the nature of it to see in the christ one whose moral standard is the highest mankind has ever reached and one who understood better than any one else the secret of happiness but that is only a starting point there is all the difference in the world between mr arnold bennett's position and the position of countless folk to-day who with no more intellectual certainty than that have decided to risk out the whole of their lives on the chances that that is true from my earliest thinking days of doubt and agnosticism i was convinced of this one thing that if there is a god at work in the universe whose purpose is good and if man can come into communion with him and consciously cooperate with him then our life here in this queer and often sad world is indeed infinitely worth while i soon found as mr arnold bennett truly says 
that my brain was utterly unequal to the sublime problem but i also found that i had a power of spiritual insight latent within me which seemed to be super rational above and beyond reason while recognizing that our religion must be reasonable and not an insult to our intelligence i at the same time discovered within me a spiritual insight a second life as mr walpole calls it reaching out beyond the gropings of my little brain and giving me a sense of awe and a desire to worship him with whom i felt myself to be in contact the gambling instinct so often perverted and used for unworthy ends is one of the most valuable instincts possessed by man and nowhere does it find a truer or more complete outlet and fulfilment than in religion as donald hankey once said to us writing from the trenches in france religion is betting your life there is a god i decided to bet my life that there is a god and more and more as the years go by i find that in so far as i yield up my will to god and open my heart to his indwelling in so far as i try to live out my everyday life in the christ spirit the experiment works peace and serenity come to the soul and harmony and balance to conflicting instincts it seems to me that by one road or another we are all coming back to the christ not so much the christ of dogma and ritual but to a layman's christ the christ of galilee and gethsemane what does he stand for to us lay folk who try to follow him not only in his relationship with other people but also in his relationship with the all father to me the christ stands for the mystery of god in man the divine spark in humanity perfectly shown forth in him but possessed in some measure by all mankind he stands for the fact that all life is sacramental the spirit showing itself in and through the material he stands for our fundamental need of communion with the father of quiet spaces in our lives when our spiritual consciousness can grow and develop the still small voice is so often drowned in all the vulgar noise and bustle of our modern hurrying life jesus went apart on to the hilltops to pray he withdrew himself for periods of quiet communion with the father and each one of us can prove for ourselves how life can be transformed and enriched beyond all description if only we will do the same above all however it is the christ who makes it possible for us to face the hard and apparently cruel places in life without despair and hopelessness behind all the crude and terrible theories of the atonement which still haunt us in many well-known hymns i believe there is eternal truth the truth that life comes through death through sacrifice and self-giving the truth of christ's eternal paradox he who would save his life shall lose it and he who would lose his life for my sake and the gospel's the same shall save it that is to say whoever lives for himself alone never really lives at all while he who gives his life away for others discovers the secret of true living through the perfect at one month of god and man in the christ all humanity is lifted nearer to the divine and freed from its bondage to the material if all this is true then the god of nature is not so different after all from the god revealed to us by christ in nature we see all life feeding upon other life all creatures giving their lives that others may live in nature this is involuntary but man has been given the awful responsibility of being free to choose in some measure whether his life shall be lived for the sake of his own little self or for the sake of god and his fellow men god saw no other way for free-willed human beings to find and fulfil themselves than the way of hardship struggle and difficulty the saints have told us over and over again that the two most paralyzing failings of our human nature are sloth and pride if we are honest with ourselves we all know that as soon as things become easy and soft for us or as soon as we become successful and popular we deteriorate 
but because god is love he could not stand aside and look on at this struggling and striving of humanity so full of suffering bewilderment and apparent defeat and so he came and still comes to share the fight and the suffering with us the workman laboring day by day in the carpenter's shop at nazareth is the eternal symbol of god in us the figure hanging dying on the tree with arms outstretched to all the world is the eternal symbol of the wondrous fact that there is a cross in the heart of god and that the way of the cross is the way of life because it is the way of love end of chapter eleven chapter twelve summary by sir arthur conan doyle mr arnold bennett's chapter which begins this book defined his position in a number of negatives he does not believe in any actual dogma of the churches and he includes immortality of the soul in his disbelief one cannot but admire the unflinching mental honesty of his declaration and also the absence of any bitterness towards those whose views may differ from his own but he is all negative and i would put it to him that man cannot live on negatives alone he must have some positive guidance and assurance if he is to have a tranquil heart in the presence of those mists which drape him in and that worldly extinction which is the only absolutely certain thing in his future a man may run for a time possibly for a lifetime upon that which he has learned when young as a motor may run onwards when the engine has been shut off but some motive power somewhere is needed if he is not to relapse into the animal i have a great sympathy with bennett's position it was my own until i learned that agnosticism is not a terminus but only a junction where you change on to another line leaving your packet of faith behind but picking up a packet of fact in exchange the same evolution may well occur to the quick brain and inquiring mind of arnold bennett he says after giving his views further than this i do not go cannot go and do not wish to go i cannot take those last words seriously if those of us who have gone further have found peace and happiness in doing so surely he would not deliberately refuse such comfort i trust the day may come when he will look into these psychic matters not superficially but with that thoroughness which they deserve and need then a strong new prophet may arise in israel mr hugh walpole followed mr arnold bennett his chapter was also distinguished for an earnest broad-mindedness but he was not so positive in his negatives as mr arnold bennett he was unorthodox but in gentler and vaguer fashion one general remark he made which was true and worth preserving he said that most of us went through three clear stages of religious thought that of the religion of childhood that of the reaction which brings disillusion and negation and finally that of the philosophy which we find for ourselves that was a helpful generalization and indeed its working is apparent in the case of each of these writers with the exception of the roman catholic personally i do not think that it would be true of a spiritualist because a belief which is reasoned from facts cannot be radically altered my own children have of course been brought up as spiritualists and i would be very surprised to learn that they have ever to traverse those deserts of doubt which their father trod before them beyond the impression of a kindly philosophic mind i do not see that mr walpole is in a position to bring help to any one else the same may be said of miss rebecca west her mind is broad and tolerant she admires the cold virtue of the puritan and she admires the sensuous but beautiful ritual of the catholic she has sympathy for all which is right and beautiful but when a traveller seeks a path and the whole horizon is indicated it does not help him forward upon his journey 
if the whole horizon is beautiful that may please the spectator but we are travellers not spectators and we want some sure guidance among the tangle of paths which lead in many directions and one or other of which we must take therefore i find miss west's admirable charity to be useless as a guide to the race i happen to know however that miss west has brushed however slightly the edge of positive psychic experiment and when she has gone further down this path she may find that which will concentrate and clarify her views mr oppenheim is kind and vague so also is mr de vere stackpole but there is nothing positive nothing that one can get a grip of in the views of either of them they are both gentlemen of the world who have seen much of life who have recognized that everywhere in humanity one finds nobility as well as baseness and that all creeds have their sinners as well as their saints both shrink as nearly every one of the writers does from the dogmatism of the churches one helpful remark is made by stackpole that as the rigidity of the churches has declined and as their power has waned mankind has perceptibly improved and that the criminal law of eighteen twenty five would shock the conscience of nineteen twenty five this is a demonstrable truth and it would seem to prove that from one cause or another the individual has developed in his moral sense on the other hand when one reflects that never has materialism been so rife never has there been such a disaster as the great war and never has there been such utter chaos in the morality of a nation as is now evident in russia one cannot claim that the whole world shares the advance after all the criminal laws of england were peculiar to england and were the most barbarous in europe just as the present divorce laws of england are the least enlightened of any civilized nation in the year twenty twenty five people will point to their reform as a proof of the progress which that century has effected mr compton mackenzie declares himself an orthodox catholic who has remained firm in the religion of his childhood well it must have saved him many mental struggles and many hours of sadness but whether it has aided that spiritual development which is the true object of life only his future experience can show if he has felt no overpowering impulse to change then it is clear that he could do no other than to stand fast where he is and enjoy those consolations true or false which his church undoubtedly does give i would remind him however that he is not yet out of the wood even in this world father tyrrell clung fast to the church but he used his own judgment and excommunication awaited him in the end sir george mirbat also alone among scientific men clung long to the church but the hour of parting came still if it makes him happy and is for his spiritual good i hope mr mackenzie will long remain in those peaceful waters and reconcile his reason to doctrines which have repelled so many earnest minds but there are points in his argument which show a strange want of proportion he talks of the tyranny of the medieval church being as no more dangerous or unpleasant than the subsequent tyranny of lawyers and finally of doctors what sort of talk is this it was the medieval church which instituted the inquisition not as a secret thing but as a recognized official branch with the patronage of popes and all high dignitaries this holy office as it was blasphemously called lasted for centuries and during that time it murdered in very cold blood by torture and by fire many tens of thousands of people whose only crime was that they were earnest in religious matters and aspired to other and as they thought higher teaching than the church gave them how could so horrible an institution the details of which cannot be read without disgust compare with any hold which modern lawyers or doctors have had upon the earth perhaps he may say that this was an old story it is not such an old story it was napoleon the first 
who released many of these victims and it carried over in south america up to our own day but the church's own axiom is that before a sin is forgiven we must have confession and contrition i have never heard of confession or contrition of the church as regards the inquisition then again compton mackenzie says my reason revolts less from a belief in the resurrection of the body than from a belief in ectoplasm and if i had to fancy a postman's eternity for myself after death an endless rat-tat on easily manipulated tables i should prefer a certain faith in my ultimate obliteration mr mackenzie does not seem to realize that what he may prefer or what he may not prefer has really no bearing upon the matter the great laws of nature and their evidence as recorded by careful observers take no heed of individual preferences if his church will allow him to read psychic books and i understand that psychic research is not yet interdicted he will find in crawford richet schwenk notzing and others ample evidence as to the existence of ectoplasm and he will understand that raps are a very small portion of our psychic experience if he can muster an equal amount of evidence for the resurrection of the physical body of course we are all agreed as to the spiritual one then he should let the world know those facts upon which he founds his faith these sneers at spiritualism are simply the measure of his own ignorance equally ignorant is my friend mr zangwill a big-brained and big-hearted man whose real philanthropic work is often covered by a needless cloak of levity he is an earnest man and he cries as so many cry it is now the common duty of all civilized men of every creed to find the next religion the idea that we the ridiculed spiritualist may have found it has never entered his head he refers to my fantasies and i suppose he attaches my name to them because i happen to be the one spiritualist among his own private acquaintances if he considers this philosophy to be some personal fad of my own he would be right to attach limited importance to it but when he knows as he should know that so many of the greatest brains of the world scientific men of the first repute eminent statesmen men whose opinion must have weight with any audience have examined this matter carefully and have finally declared that the evidence is overpowering then it is surely an example of that unhappy levity of which i have spoken that he who has not made the most elementary examination should declare the subject to be a fantasy it is a particularly unhappy word to choose for the only system of religious thought which is based not on faith or imagination but on experiment and on fact there remains the kindly pantheistic article of mr henry arthur jones i have angled for mr jones i have dropped tempting pamphlets before his nose but he has not touched my bait and yet his kindly references to our subject show that my work has not been lost the reason why i have tried to help him and succeeded perhaps in worrying him is that i have an affection for him and that i can conceive of no greater gift from one man to another than that which i wish to bestow upon him he says in a most generous passage that he will find no paradise intolerable if i am on its threshold to welcome him i told him in my answering letter that i could not presume that i should be at the rendezvous but that i had no doubts at all about him i have long looked upon henry arthur jones as one of the very first if not the very first prose writers that we possess he has that rare gift of rhythm which marks the great artist for this alone his article would be memorable take such a passage as this whatever call to wander in strangely haunted spheres of ether or fields of asphodel in new modes of being amid new duties and new pleasures whatever call to prolong and fulfil its existence my spirit may obey when it has earned its release from the flesh it is to this earth that it turns and returns and passionately clings to-day 
this earth that is the mother of all that i know and feel this earth where i have lived and sinned and suffered and loved and fought and stumbled and triumphed and despaired and laughed and wept and eaten my fill and drunk deep draughts of pleasure and success and bitter cups of misery and defeat and shame this earth whose dawns and sunsets and variegated pageantries are nicely suited to my eyes and her harmonies and discords exactly tuned to my ears this earth whose biting winds and angry hailstorms have buffeted me but whose sunny skies and blue halcyon days have restored me this very earth the only place where my foot finds firm standing and where my spirit feels itself at home there are few living men who can write such prose as that now in summing up these chapters i shall deal with my own one presently what is the prevailing characteristic it is a curious one it is that they are quite divorced from christian dogma and yet that they are all in close sympathy with the christian spirit it might also be expressed by the aphorism the less dogma the more christ that is the clear line of thought which has suggested itself to nearly every one of these writers and it represents i think and hope the general trend of the world it is full of hope for us for we cannot write our noble and epoch-making message upon a slate which is already covered with ancient and discredited inscriptions there are to my mind just two things needed for the religion for the future the christ spirit and direct spirit communion the latter will give us that ever widening knowledge which will meet and satisfy the ever growing demand of the evolving human brain and now i turn to my own modest contribution i wish the task had been placed in more capable hands i do assure you that i never go forth to meet such things but if they come to me they take the form of a challenge and i cannot pass them by i was asked to testify and i have done so to the best of my ability i have traced here my own foundation in catholicism i have shown what it was which loosened my roots in that ancient soil and how naturally the arnold bennett negative position came to me then came a long course of psychic study and experiment until i was placed in the position that i should have been an intellectual sloven and a moral coward if i did not accept conclusions which were so plain in my chapter i describe my own upbringing in the roman catholic church my revolt against doctrines and dogmas which are common to all christianity but which seem to me to be unreasonable untrue and in some ways pernicious there followed my complete severance from christianity but never from deism which is a gospel written across the whole heaven and earth carrying conviction to any brain which can appreciate the order and wonder of the universe i was never so bemused as to accept the heckel doctrine that laws were responsible for this since laws require a wise maker just as much as the more material things do then i described how gradually i became interested in psychic reading and experiment and how for many years i explored that line of thought until in the war time full proof and conviction came upon me together with an overpowering sense of the vital importance of this knowledge to mankind in their present stage of materialism and honest bewilderment i saw that the weathercock of fate could be dispensed with and the fixed signpost of fact placed in its stead i perceived how trivial the phenomena were and what tremendous issues lay behind them the tapping of an immense hidden reservoir of knowledge the only source from which a fresh and sure inspiration could be obtained i summoned our gains up as follows it is not merely the reunion with our lost ones which has been effected something much higher has been obtained we have got into contact with virtuous souls long passed over who now correspond to what were called angels 
from them we get direct religious teaching founded upon actual experience it is in many ways a new conception and yet it has come through to us in many lands and through many instruments it is simple it is reasonable above all it is extraordinarily comforting when once you are convinced of its truth this world holds no terror for you and you look into the future unafraid with no fear of death it tells us of a really merciful god whose rewards are immense and whose judgments are mild of a new world which contains that work and those pleasures which are most congenial to us of a gradual evolution from lowly paradise to the higher ones of the development of our own natural faculties of homes and family circles and the reunion of all who love even of the lowly animal world with the exclusion of all who jar such is the life beyond as pictured by those who live it i pointed out that such a line of thought does not refute essential christianity though certainly in my own case it has taught me to regard christ from the point of view of example rather than of atonement since speaking for myself alone i could not reconcile the latter with my sense of justice i had lost all faith in christ because i had been asked to believe incredible things of him now i had a new view of the whole matter which spirit teaching had given me and i expressed my position thus but the wonderful thing is that by devious paths we have got back to christianity once more and that the christ figure appears to me at least more beautiful and understandable than ever the worst that any sect can do for christ is to make him incredible now he appeared as a great heaven-sent teacher living a life which was to be our example that was surely enough without any question of a mystical atonement it is not for our mosquito brains to say what degree of divinity was in him but we can surely say that he was nearer the divine than we and that his teaching is the most beautiful of which we have cognizance so in a circle we have come back to him the great kindly brooding spirit who yearns over the world which is his special care he has ceased to be a miracle he has become our dear friend and brother such in short is my present position i quarrel with no other man's interpretation of the universe i am willing to allow that buddha moses or mahomet may adequately fill in another man's scheme the place which christ holds in mine it is essential that our spiritualism should be world-wide and that we should realize that there are many paths up the hill all is well if we can only meet at the top but surely it is manifest that some great change is needed can any one dispute that proposition all these orthodox people who give their views and their comments upon the articles overlook the fact that official christianity has had the world in its keeping for nearly fifteen hundred years surely that is a long trial and what is the result it is deeply divided in itself its teachers point in contradictory directions both the thinking classes and the working classes are largely alienated materialism is vastly increased and finally as a proof of how inoperative has been the religion of peace we have ten million men lying dead upon the ground and every nation now is planning how best to poison its neighbor in wars to come what further trials do we await before we are prepared to admit that something is wanting and that this something must be found we have come forward and we say that we have found the missing essential of religion we say that it consists in communion with those who are higher than ourselves and learning from their super mundane wisdom it is an old remedy but it is one which has been neglected in ancient days they talked of angels and prophets and thence they got their teaching if we call an angel a high spirit and a prophet a pure medium then we realize that history does indeed repeat itself they come to us these shining ones with a message which is clear definite practical reasonable and beautiful 
they discard nothing that is of value they add much which is essential they make god more understandable christ more lovable punishment more merciful heaven more desirable our own fate infinitely more hopeful and death less to be dreaded these are the gifts which we bring to the human race from the day that they are universally accepted the dark ages will be left behind and we shall advance with our own faces turned to an ever waxing light End of chapter twelve chapter thirteen the dilemma of christianity by arnold bennett in the chapter which opened the present discussion of the religious beliefs i referred to the demonstrable fact that christianity had for centuries notoriously forgotten the teaching of its own founder we have had i think a painful illustration of this forgetfulness in the reception of my article by certain sections of the christian church and organization and especially by nonconformity and the anglican press i must indeed say a word about methods of controversy let me take as an example the method of dr norwood of the city temple dr norwood seems to me to be merely rude angry and inaccurate he accuses me of an inconsistency which is not to be found in my article he calls me cock a hoop he refers to me as one who has taken little interest in religion i was ready to agree that jesus was the greatest man that ever lived dr norwood fulminating in the security of a pulpit cries his pat on the back to jesus is offensive further i am devoid of moral dynamics further dr norwood is willing to back dante against five hundred novelists and so on it is pitiable that dr norwood has not realized that the day for this kind of dialectics about christianity has gone by and will never return all the finest type of christians are aware that dogmatic christianity is now desperately on the defensive and that dialectics in the manner of dr norwood render it the very worst possible service the religious press comes out of the argument less creditably even than dr norwood take a periodical called the church times the church times describes my article as part of a stunt it describes it as a crude expression of cocksure unbelief it describes it as insolent it censures the bishops for commenting on it it says that i have a genius for securing publicity to all which my reply is that i absolutely decline to carry on any controversy on this plane the one answer to such deplorable performances as those of dr norwood and the anglican press is silence i point out their spirit and leave the thing there on the other hand the seven bishops of the church of england who commented on my article show an admirable spirit of kindliness tolerance and caution it is refreshing and reassuring to find in the responsible leaders of christianity in this country a spirit which so evidently regrets the extravagances of christian apologetics in the past and realizes the grave dangers besetting the christian faith in the present i would like particularly to express my appreciation of the letter of the bishop of st edmundsbury if during the last fifty years the defenders of the faith had displayed more of the spirit which animates that letter christianity would scarcely be in the very difficult position in which it stands to-day if i had to animadvert upon the attitude of some of the bishops i might possibly demur to the gratuitous assumption that i have no or very insufficient knowledge of what i have been talking about there is a type of man familiar to all of us who when we put before him a problem which has been seriously exercising us for a long period blandly exclaims oh my dear fellow if you will only just think a moment i do not say that any of the bishops go as far as this but some of them faintly remind me of the type let me add in the way of criticism that some of the bishops appear not to know what christian dogma is in fact being taught in nineteen twenty five 
in my article i wrote of the extraordinary and too convenient notion that a man may do as he chooses provided he dies in a certain faith some of the bishops deny that such a tenet is held by any christian for myself i was brought up in the dogma that a deathbed repentance and a sincere declaration of christian belief would secure heaven for the vilest sinner and beyond doubt this doctrine is still being preached in hundreds of pulpits the most remarkable thing about the apologia of the bishops is their anxiety to simplify dogma and their extreme caution in defending it the bishop of london writes the only dogma about it uh, christianity is a beautiful conviction that this god of nature and god of conscience appeared in human flesh in the fullness of time after a long preparation of mankind for the great event the bishop of ely writes for me christian dogma means that god who at sundry times and in diverse manners has revealed his infinite love for mankind as the crowning proof of that love sent his son to take upon him our nature and to show us in terms that we can understand what god is like and what man can become what a tremendous drastic pruning of the plant of christian dogma is here contrast the dogma of today as officially stated with the dogma of only forty years ago when i used to sit for examinations in christian evidence the doctrinal position of the bishops today would have rendered them liable to excommunication forty years ago bit by bit article by article all has gone save one thing the doctrine that christ was a direct emissary of the almighty and therefore divine in a sense in which no other man born of woman is divine yet what is forty years in the sight of the almighty if what was held true forty years ago was divinely inspired then it should be held true to-day all of it how comes it that so many things that were regarded as essential forty years ago can today be abandoned as inessential and unimportant and is there any reason why the process of lopping the tree should stop at the point which it has now reached the process has been continuous is it ended is it improbable that the bishop of london and the bishop of ely of forty years hence will be limiting christian dogma to the assertion that christ was divine in the sense in which we are all divine but to a greater degree the elements of the dilemma of dogmatic christianity can be stated simply dogmatic christianity is based on the bible and on the bible alone and the bible has proved to be very unsure ground for dogma as it was bound to prove as soon as the bias of religious tradition was eliminated from the study of it the bible is not a book it is as somebody recently very well described it an anthology as a whole it is a body of great literary value and of much moral value the best books in it are perhaps supreme in their kind but of the divine origin of any of these books no proof in my opinion has yet been brought forward which reaches the standard of demonstration demanded by historical students in secular fields of inquiry the history of the selection of the anthology that is to say of the establishment of the canon is so sinister that christian apologists seldom dare even to refer to it the bible has been riddled through and through by historical and other criticism which has never been satisfactorily answered questions of translation and of the distance of time separating the records from the events recorded strike at the roots of credence there is scarcely a passage in it upon whose interpretation all christians are agreed and there are many upon whose interpretations tens of thousands of christians have quarrelled to the point of killing one another again many passages have been frankly abandoned as unhistorical who among us has the authority to decide dogmatically what in the bible is historical and what unhistorical 
i confine myself to saying one that i have discovered nothing in the bible to convince me of the divine origin of christian doctrine as inculcated either to-day or fourteen hundred years ago and two that the number of people in my case has been rapidly increasing for many decades and is still increasing for christ's moral teaching i have already expressed the very highest admiration End of chapter 13. Chapter 14. The Last Word by the Bishop of London. I suppose it is the old habit of answering questions in Victoria Park during my time in East London, which makes it impossible for me to sit down under assertions which will be read by thousands and which may be thought true if left unanswered i have no time or space except to allude to the last chapter of mr arnold bennett and in that to three of his assertions all of which if he will forgive my saying so are entirely untrue one the first is that christianity is based on the bible and the bible alone then what about the church what about the one really successful thing in this world which is winning adherents every day of every color and in every clime throughout the world surely mr bennett must have read bishop westcott's famous book the bible in the church and has seen the part which bishop westcott with all his learning assigns to the living church of believers in determining the canon of holy scripture it was again an equally great man dean church who said that the church flows through human history as the gulf stream flows through the cold ocean and although it is perfectly true that in the church of england we may not teach anything as being essential to eternal salvation except that which has been proved by certain warrant of holy scripture and it may be said that the church to teach and the bible to prove is the motto of that church yet it would be most untrue to ignore the witness of the holy church throughout all the world which as i shall show in a moment is far more agreed than mr bennett would allow two but then comes the even more astonishing statement that the bible has been riddled through and through by historical and other criticism i wonder whether this book will penetrate to asia minor if so my friend sir william ramsay whom i saw off on his way there a few months ago will be smiling when he reads the copy which contains such a statement no doubt a reader like mr bennett has read sir william ramsay's church in the roman empire and st paul the traveller and will know that he is dealing with one of the greatest archaeologists of modern times i can remember well when those books appeared more than twenty-five years ago and the help they were to me in dealing with my secularist opponents always to me as courteous as mr arnold bennett himself here was a man not a parson who went to asia minor imagining that the acts of the apostles was a second century document and after years of study of the inscriptions he found there coming back to tell the world in those entrancing volumes that the travel document which makes up the greater part of the acts of the apostles was the best authority existing in the world on the state of the roman empire in the first century so much for modern discovery having riddled the bible through and through but this is of course only one illustration of the immense debt we owe to modern science and historical research for our understanding of the bible in reading through a good many of the articles which have been written on my religion one cannot help feeling that many of the writers were brought up in their youth under very unintelligent teaching about the bible no one imagines now that it was intended to teach us science modern criticism has shown us how mistaken we were not the bible itself about the dates of many of the books we are able now to distinguish between legend and history between figurative and literal statements and instead of such criticism riddling the bible through and through it has immensely added to its charm and interest i should like to recommend to my readers such a cheap and interesting book as mr anthony dean's how to enjoy the bible 
it is well worth reading three but then we get to the most amazing statement of all there is scarcely a passage in it on whose interpretation all christians are agreed as one who has taken rather a leading part in the effort to reunite christendom i am sure that it will comfort mr bennett to know that the surprising thing we find is that the points on which christians are agreed outnumber ten to one those on which they differ i had two years conferences with the wesleyan ministers and laymen at london house and they would all bear me out when i say that our differences were on matters of church order or the importance to be attached to this or that church ordinance rather than on the essential truths of the christian religion such as the incarnation atonement and the truth of the holy trinity similarly when i had staying in my house for a visit this summer the patriarchs and metropolitans of the eastern church there was no difference whatever in the importance we attached to the great doctrines of the christian church again hopeless for the moment as any reunion with the roman church seems to be we would all in the church of england be the first to acknowledge the magnificent witness throughout the world to the being of god the incarnation the atonement and the reality of sacramental grace which the roman church has borne it was mr gladstone who said and i quote from memory i bow my head before the great truths common to all christians the incarnation the atonement and the doctrine of the holy trinity but while i feel bound to point out these facts in opposition to mr bennett's statements let me say that we feel grateful to men like himself who have written so freely of their religious ideas which they so often keep to themselves i would say in conclusion for the arrival of thirty ordination candidates this afternoon brings my time to a close that on the whole discussion three things strike me one that this vague pantheism which seems the religion of so many of the authors has no power to save souls it was said of an eloquent preacher once that there was not enough gospel in his sermons to save a tom tit these authors live in a world of fiction we ministers of the gospel do our work in a world of stern fact we have to mend broken lives and feed starving souls i think if the author of broken earthenware had been asked to write one of the articles he would have told a different tale we want and the modern world wants some evidence that god has done something to help it and it is this belief that he has done something and something effectual which has gone to the heart of the world when gandhi can stand up before fifteen thousand bengalis and make his sole speech one sentence i owe and india owes more than can be expressed to one who never set his foot in it and that is jesus christ we are seeing the dawn of a belief in the east that vague pantheism is not enough two the second remark i would make is that if the light has shown it will be the light which will judge us and not we the light i often think of that remark of the doorkeeper to the supercilious visitor who had just come out of a gallery of masterpieces in florence i don't think much of these masterpieces he said to the doorkeeper these pictures sir are not on their trial it is the spectators who are on their trial and it is just as well for us bishops as well as popular novelists to remember that the word which we have heard the same shall judge us at the last day three and the last thing i would emphasize as i tried to express in my letter on mr bennett's first article is the fallacy of expecting the effect of christianity to survive christianity itself what produced in the world this gospel of kindness in which all these writers say they believe historically nothing whatever but a belief in the new testament as a record of fact a witty judge once said to me there are some people who are trying to have the grin without the cat but even in alice in wonderland the grin gradually vanished 
let the efforts now being made to undermine the belief of the young in historical christianity really succeed and although the effect which it has produced in the world may survive for a time we have no sort of guarantee that it will continue for long to regulate the unruly passions of mankind End of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen appendix correspondence from the bishop of salisbury to the editor sir as i read mr arnold bennett's article on what i believe i was impressed once again by a familiar phenomenon mr bennett is typical of a class there are many who like him value the ethics and spirit of christianity but deny the origin of it all mr bennett has presumably had the advantage of being born in a christian land in a land where the dogmas of christianity which he dislikes so much have been steadily taught for fourteen hundred years or so he may think little of them but in point of fact he is himself saturated through and through by the atmosphere they have created and he probably owes to christianity far more than he acknowledges or knows he admits indeed that the christian virtues many of which he mentions are the only basis of an enduring religion and i do not doubt that he practices them in his own life this seems to be a very common attitude of mind men admire the fruit but ignore the root they appreciate the effect but they ignore the cause yet the phenomena of christianity whether in history or experience demand an explanation and few will deny notwithstanding the facile assumptions of mr bennett and his circle of friends that christianity is a living force to-day what is behind it what is the motive force behind the amazing output of beneficence which stands in the name of christianity what is the secret of the fruitful labor of the lifelong sacrifice of many christians why not believe what these devoted people say of themselves that they owe all to a living person who is ever present with them to cleanse and inspire and guide st clair serum from the bishop of lincoln to the editor sir we owe so much to mr arnold bennett as novelist and playwright that we are naturally interested to know what he believes with regard to the deeper things of human life it seems to me that mr bennett believes more than he thinks he does and i suspect that his belief faint though it be has a more direct influence on his daily actions than he is aware he is certainly inclined to believe that god is and thinks a future life more probable than not what may be the attributes of god and his ultimate aim he declares that he knows not he however immediately deduces from the fact of conscience that the aim of god in the creation and slow evolution of his universe is a moral aim here the believing christian will be in entire accord with him i may add also that i do not know any intelligent christian who would question his rejection of what he calls the convenient notion that a man may do as he chooses provided he dies in a certain faith i should have thought that such a rejection was a commonplace of christian ethical teaching where i find myself most directly at issue with mr arnold bennett is with regard to his estimate of the value of what we may know about god and with regard to his judgment as to the relationship between a man's life and what he really believes we are denizens of a very wonderful and very mysterious world the wisest of men is the most ready to confess that what we know is slight as compared with the vast unknown yet what we know is worth while we live by it and prove it in life meanwhile the universe challenges us and we ever seek to penetrate further into its mystery and in this adventure we live so we know little of god but i submit that we know something god reveals himself in nature in man and in our own deeper consciousness but such knowledge as i have i live i prove it in life it makes life and the system of things of which i find myself a part in some measure intelligible to me and bearable by me and it is in this adventure of the soul that i live 
i find it difficult also to accept mr bennett's disparagement of dogma dogma after all is what a man believes he need hold his belief none the less securely because countless others have held it with him and have lived and died by it and in it mr bennett admits i do not believe that a man can think evil and do good i agree but herein is expressed the case for dogma if god is god is the ultimate reality it seems to me it must matter immeasurably what a man believes about the ultimate reality whether for instance he sincerely believes that back of all and beyond all there is an eternal loving kindness or whether he believes that beyond all there is a blind and unknown force mr bennett has raised i need hardly say far more questions than i can attempt to deal with in this brief communication w s lincoln from the bishop of gloucester to the editor sir i have been asked to express my opinion on mr arnold bennett's statement of what i believe and i think that the best course i can pursue is to state shortly and clearly what i believe christianity teaches i notice that mr arnold bennett has quite made up his mind that christianity is not true although he does not show much knowledge of what its teaching really is nor give any signs of having investigated the question of its truth i would venture to say in reply that as the result of investigations carried on for many years i am convinced on historical grounds of the truth of christianity and feel that it gives a more satisfying explanation of the facts of the universe than any creed i am acquainted with the fundamental tenet of christianity is the revelation of god through jesus christ man cannot of himself know about god though he may be able to understand some of his workings therefore jesus the son of god became man that he might reveal to mankind the true nature of god and the true destiny of man these are complementary truths depending one on the other mr arnold bennett is prepared to accept the christian morality or what he considers to be such but he does not see that the morality is meaningless unless the structure of the world harmonizes with it a man to accept the christian moral code must be convinced that the world is such as to make that code real the revelation in christ teaches us then the nature of god it not only teaches us but it exhibits to us god in human form so that we can understand it it tells us that god is a god of order and righteousness and love and if god be a god of love if love is one of his eternal attributes then the godhead cannot be a solitary person for love demands a subject and an object so while the doctrine of the incarnation shows to us how god is revealed to man the doctrine of the trinity shows us how love is part of the essence and nature of god and the death of jesus on the cross for mankind reveals to us also how that self-sacrifice which in mankind is the highest exhibition of human love is something fundamental to the universe for it is part of the nature of god himself so a believing christian when he is faced by the realities of the world as put before us for example in the great war is not bewildered he thinks that the war has come through the lusts of mankind he feels the pathos of it but through the horror of the war he sees the continuous exhibition of human self-sacrifice and recognizes that while it arises from the failure of men it reveals mankind's highest qualities and as christ revealed to us the nature of god so he reveals to us the duty of the destiny of man mr arnold bennett approves of the christian morality but i do not think that he grasps it in its completeness he makes it a religion of kindliness that seems to present it as something weak and almost sentimental of course the christian should be kindly but he is much more than that god is a god of righteousness and self-restraint and sacrifice as well as of love and man's life must exhibit all these qualities 
mr arnold bennett does not believe in heaven and hell but he tells us on a balance of probabilities i am inclined to accept the theory of a future life and i am fairly sure that if indeed there is a future life my conduct in this present life will materially affect the nature of it i think that really he puts in these words the sum of what is meant by the belief in heaven and hell he objects again to a religion of faith but almost immediately afterwards he tells us i think that every act counts forever either for or against the ultimate fulfilment of happiness i might say every thought as well as every act but if he recognizes this he recognizes everything that is implied in faith faith means the acceptance of a relation of christ and therefore the full realization of what men should do and the spirit in which they should do it it means that acts by themselves if they do not spring from a right motive are not good and the motive is love the love of man and the love of god faith without works is bad but works without faith are not good works at all and then finally christianity responds to all the highest religious aspirations of the human soul for it puts before us a god who is love it puts before us the loftiest possible ideal of life and presents god to us incarnate in christ living and dying for man and so responding to all our affections and hopes and aspirations it presents to us an adequate guide for conduct an adequate explanation of the reality of things and an adequate object of worship a c gloucester the palace gloucester from the bishop of st edmundsbury in ipswich to the editor sir it hardly seems necessary for another episcopal voice to be added to those which have with so much sympathy endorsed the line of conduct which mr arnold bennett advocated as being indeed of the very essence of christian life to try to pursue that line of conduct the line which seems to him so right it is indeed a matter of supreme importance it is in regard to the dogmatic background and the motives which give this line its force that differences of opinion exist i think perhaps it may be worth pointing out that religious thought throughout the ages has been a process of development in the course of that development particular doctrines have from time to time been advocated as though they were of the essence of christianity and perhaps its most important feature which nevertheless have proved to be mistaken or imperfect and to need supplementing by many other considerations stated by themselves they are sometimes strictly untrue and even a travesty of christianity so much of the criticism of christian dogma today is concerned with these matters which are not material or are even contradictory to the central truth in the course of religious history human nature has really won great central spiritual truths which it is pure loss to disregard it is surely not the line of a wise man to cut himself off from this great stream of thought but rather to try to build upon it and to do what many of us are trying to do today to reinterpret those truths in the light of the great accession of knowledge which our own generation has won there is another aspect of religion which is worth stating the christian creed is not only a matter of thought it conceives that it has laid hold of a secret of power the inner man is not only mind he includes those thoughts aspirations emotions and acts of will which assure us that we have a nature which is spiritual the secret of life is to be found in the conscious response that comes to us from the great spirit god sir arthur conan doyle has arrived at this conviction largely through the strength of his natural affections and the losses which many of us shared in the war there is a more direct approach to the spirit world it is by looking for and presently becoming conscious of him who is the fount of spiritual as well as physical life it would manifestly be absurd to say that no one can do the things which christ approves unless he is consciously in communion with him the lives of many good men show that is not so 
but that there is available for those who look for it a spirit that will guide into truth and a power that will mould their wills and their character i for my part can find no room to question it is however well for us to remember that in my father's house or household are many abiding places and some may have their niche there whose christianity we fail to recognize w g st edmund and ipswich the bishop's house ipswich from the bishop of liverpool to the editor sir mr arnold bennett is right in claiming that he shares his beliefs with a large number of people i have many friends who believe as he does and they seem to me as he tells us that a few christian friends of his seem to him to possess real intelligence but what i always feel about them is that they have not brought their intelligence to bear upon religion with the same thoroughness that they use in their other thinking they all object to dogma they argue as he does that such christian virtues as kindliness forgiveness and humility can be effective without it i should certainly agree that there have been and are and will be many individuals who naturally prefer kindly acts and perform as many of them as they can but are not interested in dogma or even religion what that generally means is that they have not considered it worth while to think out the reason why they and others prefer and perform these acts there are some people who do not find it enough to ascribe this preference to a universal conscience which comes from god about whom nothing further can be known i have never understood why the belief or may i say the dogma that the attributes and aims of god are unknowable should be regarded as a mark of superior intelligence christianity is a way of life and cannot be fairly judged by any who are not trying it but it is also a system of thought very imperfectly expressed in dogma that god lives and works in men inspiring whether they are aware of it or not their wisdom their achievement their natural goodness demonstrating by his supreme act of sacrifice that love is the highest power in the world bidding them work with him in this power to finish his creation and promising higher wisdom greater achievement and purer goodness to all who realize and respond to his love all this is if you will an hypothesis we believe it to be revealed truth but in any case it deserves more serious consideration than many of our trained minds are giving it so examined it might possibly prove to be as reasonable a guide to the attributes of god and his relationship with men as the argument from design is to his existence albert liverpool from dr norwood to the editor sir mr arnold bennett puts himself in a position which makes a rejoinder by an ordinary christian somewhat difficult he says i do not believe and never have at any time believed in the divinity of christ heaven hell the immortality of the soul the divine inspiration of the bible the christian dogma he adds does not enter into my social spiritual or intellectual life at all nor does the dogma of any other religion so commonplace are these denials that he and his friends very rarely trouble to repeat them much less argue about them plainly there would not be sufficient standing ground for argument as between him and the christian one is impressed of course by the airy wave of the hand with which he dismisses such trifles i could imagine that if he had taken the same attitude towards say wireless telegraphy marconi might have appealed to him in vain his statement that he does not believe and never has at any time believed in the immortality of the soul is difficult to reconcile with his later statement that on a balance of probabilities i am inclined to accept the theory of a future life apparently this cock-a-hoop attitude involves some dangers to consistency he is to be congratulated that among so many negations he has such an abundant belief in conscience 
he has found it to be a force which tends always in the direction of justice mercy and kindness and this to him is the strongest argument for the existence of god some of us have an equally strong belief in conscience but we had not noticed that invariably it tended in the direction of mercy and kindness we thought it required some instruction before that beautiful result could be secured we would have credited robespierre or lenin with a conscience but had overlooked its resultant mercy and kindness mr bennett has discovered a type of christian it has not been my fortune to meet yet though i have heard of him when on occasion i have listened to hyde park oratory i mean the man who has the extraordinary and too convenient notion that he may safely do as he chooses provided he dies in a certain faith for one who has taken so little interest in religion he has been fortunate in his discoveries more serious students of the subject seem to miss these rare specimens considering mr bennett's final and confident faith in the supremacy of the law of kindliness his conviction that everything else will fail his heartfelt admission that christ fulfilled this law perfectly and in the field of morals was the greatest man that ever lived might it not be possible that even such a word as divinity would repay a little more thought f w norwood the city temple london from the bishop of london to the editor sir you have kindly invited me to comment upon any of those articles on my religion and i would rather comment on the one sent from mr arnold bennett as i know him personally and i know that he will not resent anything that i may say what strikes me at once is that his premises really carry him further than he allows himself to go for instance he feels strongly the argument from design and still more strongly the argument from conscience but both these arguments if admitted carry us a very long way a form of letters cannot throw itself into a play of shakespeare because there is a mark of mind in the play the atoms of the universe cannot have thrown themselves into the ordered universe because there is clearly a mark of mind in that play also and not only of a mind but of a beneficent mind the beauty of nature has never been explained yet except on the hypothesis that it is the result of a beautiful mind which meant to plan a pleasant home for those who were to be created the fact that animals feed upon one another does not disprove this for every naturalist will tell us that the animal creation is a happy one moreover we ourselves are not necessarily depraved because we eat mutton chops but as mr bennett sees so clearly the fact of the existence of conscience carries us much further it gives a character to the possessor of the mind as dr chalmers the great scotch preacher once said would god have put a reclaiming witness against himself in the breast of every one if he was not righteous that insistent voice which says you ought you must can only come from some one who is himself good but it is perfectly true that if left at this point without further guidance we might be without that kindliness for which mr bennett pleads and for which st paul pleaded many years ago when he said without charity we are nothing and here of course it is that christianity comes in you can call it dogmatic christianity if you like but the only dogma about it is a beautiful conviction that this god of nature and god of conscience appeared in human flesh in the fullness of time after a long preparation of mankind for the great event and not only so but that he still lives on the same yesterday today and forever and that we may have a daily communion with him by prayer and sacrament historically it has been that belief which has furnished the spirit of charity which mr bennett evidently breathes himself and which he rightly demands in others but in disowning historic christianity he is really quite unconsciously no doubt kicking down the ladder which has brought him so far i feel sure that if he had as much to do with those face to face with death 
or struggling with temptations which almost overwhelm them as we who are in the ministry have daily to do he would feel the need of this further revelation of the character and power and love of god which christianity teaches a f london from the bishop of ely to the editor sir the article on which you invite my comment would require a treatise or series of treatises if a full answer were to be supplied i hope mr arnold bennett will not think me impertinent if i suggest that his faith goes much deeper than he cares to acknowledge he is agnostic in the liberal and inoffensive sense as to the future life and yet admits that if there is such a life his conduct in this life will materially affect the nature of it he is not agnostic as to the existence of a creator with a clear aim for his creation the argument from design and the universality of conscience provide this conviction and he is at one upon the worthlessness of religion without love or kindliness he accepts the moral teaching of our lord jesus christ and quotes some of his practical injunctions and all would agree with him in acknowledging that if christians had in the past and in the present lived up to the standard of their religion the church would be in a very different position but is he not bound by his own admissions to go a step further if he accepts the teaching of jesus christ as to the brotherhood of man can he reject his teaching as to the fatherhood of god and the revelation of the nature and purpose of the father in the person of the incarnate son can he really doubt that the aim of the creator is for his children when jesus christ and his followers proclaim that god is love and that he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in god and god in him mr bennett believes that jesus christ understood the secret of happiness better than any one but does he not define happiness as perfect union with the father such as he himself enjoyed and which we can share with him through the spirit is it not really theological definitions rather than dogma which he repudiates for me christian dogma means that god who at sundry times and in diverse manners has revealed his infinite love for mankind as the crowning proof of that love sent his son to take upon him our nature and to show us in terms that we can understand what god is like and what man can become and i find the secret of happiness in the forgiveness of sin which otherwise wrecks my happiness and in the hope that some day somewhere i even i may by his grace become something like my saviour and my god who is the impersonation of that love which is mr bennett's ideal leonard ely from bishop weldon dean of durham to the editor sir mr arnold bennett if i may judge him by his article seems to be a rather lax theist he is i am afraid too a rather loose thinker upon religion i am at a loss to understand why he goes as far as he does go and then stops dead like other theists he rests his belief upon the scientifically ordered and law-controlled character of the universe but why should he not like other theists seek to derive from the universe some conception of the nature and purpose of the first cause or supreme being whom he calls god he says also that he believes in conscience but does not the human conscience suggest to him that the creator of the conscience must himself be a moral being are there no inferences which flow from the morality of such a being and if there is a moral power governing the universe does not man stand in some relation and does he not owe a certain duty to that power mr arnold bennett says he has never believed in heaven or hell or the immortality of the soul but he adds that he is inclined to accept the theory of a future life is it not then reasonable that he should order his present life in accordance with that belief after all the doctrine thou god seest me has been and still is a strong motive to righteousness it was pascal who said that all life depended upon the answer to the question whether the soul were immortal or not 
mr arnold bennett need not wait for certainty upon these high topics it is enough that he should arrive at the best judgment possible to him upon them and should act in conformity with that judgment mr arnold bennett repudiates the doctrine of christ's divinity he holds indeed that christ better than anybody understood the secret of happiness but nobody who reads the gospels can doubt that the secret of happiness according to our lord's teaching was relative to god and to the future life after all our lord's moral teaching was a part but only a part of his gospel does mr bennett believe his word when he declared that he was free from sin that he could pardon the sins of all men that he could give rest to all the weary and heavy laden souls on earth and that at the last he would come again to be the judge of all the living and the dead if he does not believe these sayings of our lord what is his theory of our lord's person as revealed in the gospels but if he does believe them do they not imply a belief in our lord's superhuman being i e in his divinity a thoughtful man cannot i hold reasonably abstain from forming some estimate of our lord's nature of his relation to god of his miracles and of the origin of his church i repeat that mr arnold bennett is not bound to know these things but is i think bound by his own conscience to form some judgment upon them the very word creed denotes not knowledge but belief and he who can say i believe has entered into the sanctuary of religion let me add that mr arnold bennett makes a mistake if he thinks the church of christ regards salvation as dependent not upon conduct but upon belief in our lord's great parable of the final judgment it is they who have done good that enter into eternal felicity and they who have done evil that are subject to eternal retribution i can feel no doubt that jesus christ still holds in his pierced hands the key to the mystery of human life i do not wish to encumber his religion with superfluous obligations whether of practice or of belief but i feel able and willing to trust that they who seek faithfully to live in the spirit of his moral law which mr arnold bennett so unreservedly approves will at the last receive his abiding benediction j e c weldon the deanery durham from dr dinsdale t young to the editor sir it is no sign of superior intelligence to deny the orthodox christian creed i observe that some who do deny it beg the question by talking of thinking and culture as if these involved unbelief nothing of the sort it is time this were clearly and emphatically asserted deniers of the christian faith must give us arguments not assumptions i make bold to say that the intellect of history and of today is on the side of the gospel of christ it is easy to throw dust in the eyes of readers by false innuendos let us appeal to the common sense of most i like dr johnson find my religion in a book and that book is the bible there many of the noblest intellects of the world have found their religion i instant bishop butler mr gladstone lord salisbury bishop westcott and could adduce a host of gifted men and women are their testimonies not as valid as any novelist or any other writers or any other witnesses i accept the bible as the word of god i believe myself to be a sinner full by nature of guilt and corruption do they rightly know their hearts who deem themselves otherwise i believe not i believe my deep tremendous need of a savior my need is met when i receive by simple faith the atoning work of christ i believe in christ as the son of god who is also god the son the bible says that whoever receives him as his savior has life and whoever rejects him has not life and i believe it thus faith expresses itself in a course of conduct which is pure and kind and unselfish and full of the service of humanity in so far as my faith is real i live in love to god and man 
i seek to help others the poor the suffering the disadvantaged are those i must try to help history discloses the reality of this faith individual experience confirms it let who will assail it on this rock i stand by this i can live tranquilly and usefully and in this faith i shall die in peace and hope judged by these standards i know of no adequate rival to the evangelical christian faith dinsdale t young central hall westminster from the rev h tiddeman chilvers to the editor sir while i am interested i am also amazed at what your contributors conceive to be their religion they state very frankly what is my religion but i should like to ask them what is their conception of true religion apart from themselves what is their final court of appeal in dealing with such a subject from what do they deduct their beliefs not one of the writers refers to the bible which is the only authoritative and infallible revelation of true religion without for the moment insisting for any specific interpretation of the book one is almost shocked that there is no definite reference made thereto but rather a display of ignorance of its affirmations there is no acknowledgment of sin whatever their definition of that term might be neither is there any expressed faith in christ as a redeemer nor any reference to the divine paraclete as the enlightener of the human mind surely one is justified in expecting of any who proclaim to the world what they call my religion manifestos which without requiring rigid definitions and interpretations might contain some reference to the revelation of god in and through the divine logos also some reference with reverence to such a statement as christ died for our sins eliminate these two fundamental truths from the history of the last nearly two thousand years and what have you left in the light of the bible the content of which no living man is accountable for the articles my religion fall far short of what that book claims to be the true and only religion for mankind h tiddeman chilvers metropolitan tabernacle s e two from gypsy smith to the editor sir in response to your request that i should give my comment on the series of articles on my religion i am unable to do justice to the matter in the space you give me the way the writers express themselves is illuminating in many ways i confine myself to one line of thought namely the want of real knowledge about spiritual things surely those who confess that they have no faith in revealed religion as taught by jesus in the new testament and no faith in the divinity of jesus cannot be looked up to by intelligent people as experts they cannot be any authority for those who are earnestly and honestly looking for truth and light we would not turn to one who confessed he had no taste for music and knew nothing about it for an expert opinion about the works of beethoven the fugues of bach or the scherzos of chopin here in cambridge it is the expert who is listened to the man who knows the man who does not know cannot impart knowledge take the word of nature who would go to one who had lived all his life in a narrow slum and had never seen a green field bathed with summer sunshine or knew the marvels and wonders of nature to describe the richness of the rose the beauty of the bluebell the poetry of the primrose to paint the opening of the gates of the morning without a creak on their hinges or to tell of the magic of their silent clothes at nightfall while the feathered vespers fill the air to explain how god took a little vapor from a muddy street and kissed it into a rainbow and it became an arched bridge on which angels might stand and watch the storm die you go to one who has lived with nature caught her moods and knows how to teach and tell of her he must know why should a man refuse to believe the christian faith because he cannot understand all it means why not refuse to eat bread because we cannot find out where the first grain of wheat came from 
why not refuse to eat beef and mutton because we cannot explain how two animals living in the same field eating the same grass and drinking the same water turn grass and water into beef and mutton why refuse to believe the soul is immortal the man who says he does not accept immortality was in existence many months before he arrived in this world i wonder if it ever occurs to him that since this is a fact he may be in existence after he departs from this life but does not all this take us back to the words jesus spoke to one who thought he knew it all art thou a master in israel and knowest not these things if i tell you of earthly things and ye believe not know not how shall ye believe no if i tell you of heavenly things the natural man cannot understand the things of god they are foolishness unto him spiritual things are spiritually understood if a man cannot explain a rosebud how can he explain the rose of sharon and the lily of the valley if beaten by the mysteries of geology how can he explain the rock of ages if the world of sun moon and stars baffles how much more the star of bethlehem and the day star from on high if a tiny hedge sparrow's egg is unexplainable and it is think of the wonder of the color and the beautiful porcelain whence does that little bird get its pottery whence its sky-blue color if that is beyond you how can you expect with finite mind to explain god jesus christ god is known as we know and love jesus no man cometh unto the father but by me the father said of jesus this is my beloved son hear ye him peter writing later said this voice we heard when we saw his glory and were with him in the holy mount religion is not science or theology or knowledge it is an experience of the heart paul said i live yet not i it is christ that liveth in me paul was no fool his brain was as big as any living today and as well trained no scientist is as sure of the working of any law no physician is as sure of a specific no mathematician is as sure of an axiom as i am that jesus christ came into my gypsy tent and converted my rough swearing drinking pilfering gypsy father into a clean tender honorable strong beautiful christian man without bible books or bishops that life which was a terror became winsome and lovely until his motherless children were one to the same lord the same faith the same surrender yes jesus came into that tent and kissed it till it shines like an old cathedral can mr arnold bennett explain this miracle apart from the religion of the new testament taught by the divine christ except a man be born again he cannot see the kingdom of god it is not knowledge of the head but an experience of the heart and therefore it becomes heart knowledge gypsy smith romany tan cambridge to the editor sir the novelists who are writing about the christian religion are seeking to destroy the faith the fruit of which they are daily enjoying christ gave us a test if any man will do his god's will he shall know of the doctrine whether it be of god or whether i speak of myself will the writers of these articles honestly and sincerely apply the test s campbell south kensington to the editor sir one fact stands out from all the interesting articles yet published that the writers will not accept a religion that does not satisfy their finite intellects in other words reason and understanding must precede faith the creator surely may prescribe the manner in which his creatures may approach him and it is written he that doeth the will of god shall know countless numbers do and have known because they have followed the way indicated in holy scripture and interpreted by all branches of the catholic church h w braithwaite abbey house victoria street southwest one to the editor sir 
i do not propose to write anything further about christian dogma i was asked to state my religious views and i stated them as briefly and plainly as possible that they should arouse resentment was inevitable that people should find in my articles arrogance and inconsistency i regret i have no pretension to be an expert on religious dogma i have no desire to force my views on others much less to float a new religion yours faithfully arnold bennett seventy five cadogan square southwest one end of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen challenge to mr bennett by dr norwood minister of the city temple dr norwood who was referred to by mr arnold bennett in his chapter the dilemma of christianity as rude angry and inaccurate replies below mr arnold bennett having expressed his opinion of myself with perfect candor remarks the one answer to such deplorable performances as those of dr norwood and the anglican press is silence i point out their spirit and leave the thing there many will regret this decision they are much more interested in mr bennett's views upon religion than in his opinions of individuals they would rather that instead of breaking entirely new ground in his second article he had cleared up the ambiguities of his first one of the penalties of such leadership as mr bennett has achieved is that a loose statement to which we all are prone is embarrassing to his friends as well as of advantage to his opponents if mr bennett should write a third article it is to be hoped that he will spare time to clear up certain statements in the first which attracted such wide attention i will refrain just now from following him into the new territory at least until after the third article may have been written i pointed out in my first reply that after stating i do not believe and never have at any time believed in the immortality of the soul he subsequently added on a balance of probabilities i am inclined to accept the theory of a future life that seems to me inconsistent under the same category of absolute unbelief he also included heaven and hell but later said i think that every act counts forever either for or against the ultimate fulfillment of happiness that likewise seems inconsistent to me it rather appears as if while looking the other way he has inadvertently walked backwards into the christian camp christians are not committed to any pictorial representation of either post-mortem state but only to the eternal validity and consequence of right and wrong he also said that conscience which seems to him an argument for the existence of god more cogent than the rather physical argument from design is a force which tends always in the direction of justice mercy and kindness unless both specialists and ordinary people are entirely mistaken there are often no more merciless and cruel deeds than some that are done with a perfectly sound conscience i wish he would clear up that point for us he also said i absolutely dismiss the extraordinary and too convenient notion that a man may safely do as he chooses provided he dies in a certain faith i entirely agree with him i do not believe and never have at any time believed such a thing but in vindicating the statement in the second article he says i was brought up in the dogma that a deathbed repentance and a sincere declaration of christian belief would secure heaven for the vilest sinner there is really of course a world of difference between repentance even of the deathbed variety coupled with a sincere declaration of christian belief and a man safely doing as he chooses i am not discussing either tenet just now but merely appealing for lucidity mr bennett is perplexed because in referring to his cautious statement i should not care to assert that in the field of morals christ was not the greatest man that ever lived i called it a pat on the back for jesus and added that it was offensive rather than consoling he concludes the second article with a perfectly charming addendum for christ's moral teaching i have already expressed 
the very highest admiration i am satisfied now that mr bennett does not know how patronizing such statements sound and therefore acquit him of any conscious offence i did not dispute mr bennett's right but i questioned his historical judgment in saying that christianity is the least satisfactory of all the oriental creeds of which he has knowledge save only that of mohammedanism i said that in my opinion his opening article did not attain to the same high level which was reached by those who followed him i said that it did not do justice to his ability and reputation that was fair comment i made it in the same frank spirit as i accept his opinion of myself there is little to be gained by cross-firing between individuals the cause is very great and to many inexpressibly sacred but i fail to see why my revered friends the bishops should be complimented upon their admirable spirit of kindliness tolerance and caution for saying that he occupies very nearly the christian position while i am merely rude angry and inaccurate for letting go without challenge his own statement that broadly speaking the christian dogma does not enter into my social spiritual or intellectual life at all to me it seems that excessive amiability involves some obliquity of vision may we not be frank without being rude surely a man who loves a cause may defend it against destructive criticism especially when the latter is full of inconsistencies i have a great respect for mr bennett and am deeply indebted to him for pleasure and instruction derived from many of his works but all of us fall below par at times i have sympathy with a busy author and journalist who is persuaded to plunge into a discussion for which he has not made sufficient direct preparation mr bennett is scarcely justified however with all his versatility in breaking new ground until he has cleared up the contradictions and inaccuracies involved in his first article may i add that these frank discussions of religious difficulties are all to the good it would be a great pity if mere personal antagonisms obscured the vital issues end of chapter sixteen end of my religion by various authors